Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. How's it going? Noodles, good to see you. Every time I immediately say hello, I immediately need a drink. Mmm. Wadsworth, hello. How's it going? How's your week so far? I have no anecdotes to report today. <laughs> Nothing new. <laughs> um, doing okay. Good. Yeah, it is still kind of early. We'll see. We'll we'll see how it goes. Can we talk about that change out cosplay? Yes, we can. We can. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was easier than I thought it was going to be, but still, of course, I waited to do things until the last minute and uh, was working late into the night, <laughs> the night before, but it's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the photo that I posted, uh, you can't see my pants, but there's a couple group photos that are floating around Twitter. Um, where it's like full body, but I did make those pants and I made my my mask too. But yeah, it was fun. It was good. Most people did not know who I was, but the people who did were very excited. <laughs> and then like when you tell people that uh, like oh I'm I'm Chain Chomp, they're like ah ah yes I get it I see now. <laughs> I did make the pants. Yeah, yeah. I made I made the pants. I'm starting to make more and more of my clothes just because um, I don't always find what I'm looking for. So might as well just make what I know I'm gonna wear. So yeah, I made I made my pants, and I m made them before I even knew that I was going to cosplay um, as a chain chomp, and I was like, this will just be perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was the first time I've met Heather and Diana in person. We've chatted before, but have never physically met. And the, when we, like, saw each other, we're like, oh, hi, <laughs> can I hug you? Like, that sort of thing. Because we already know, like, who I'm, well, like, I know them and they know me. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was a fun reunion. Cool to meet uh, your online friends in person. <laughs> Yes, Wadsworth, you need to. It's a must. <laughs> it's fun. Yes, yeah. Ayana's cosplays are amazing. So amazing. She's so talented. It's wild. I was looking at the other the um the other ones that she did on Saturday and Sunday. So so good. So good. <laughs> but yes. Now I don't have anything to cosplay for. For a long time. That's okay. I'm I'm sure I'll find something. Hey, Grouchy! Yes, it was good seeing you too! Yes, yes, yes! It's wild seeing online friends in person. It's so exciting. <laughs> yes, yes, it was so nice meeting you. Yeah, c 2 e was fun. Tiring, as always, but fun as always. And every year, so I've only ever been on one day, and I've been three different years, um, and every year after my one day, it's like, oh, I need to come all three days every year, and I never do. <laughs> I never actually do it, but I know that I want to. I know it. Oh, thank you so, so much, Grouchy. Oh, Yes. So w one of these years, I will be there all three days. It's just more of an excuse to dress up, right? I, I like I need excuses, but apparently I do. Let's see. And C2E2 is the only con. Oh, no, that's not true. I was going to say it's the only con that I've ever been to, but it's not true. I've been to... Uh, What's it called? Yumacon in Detroit. I went there one year with friends. You had a ball cosplaying all three days. Okay. The the head? Amazing. Um I I don't remember. <laughs> but
But I remember it being so, so amazing. And also the first time that your partner has done this. Incredible. Incredible. I was talking about that er later after I saw you guys. I was talking about it to someone and, like, explaining, like, the big, like, cat and the detail that went into it. And I was like, it was so insane and beautiful and I would never be able to do something like that. <laughs> You gotta hide away in the car with me. Yes. <laughs> Just sneak in. Just leave me in the trunk. Oh, that was so good. So good. And all by hand. Amazing. Just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Very talented. Yeah, every oops, I'm gonna turn the sound off of my off of my phone. Um, but every time I go, one of the most exciting things about going to a convention is seeing all of the cosplays and, like, all of the excitement that people have around their cosplays. And, of course, Grouchy, of course you should be proud of it. It was insane and beautiful. But I super enjoy that. Just, like, and, like, some of the things, like, I don't know what, what they're from, but they're amazing, and they're wonderful and glorious, and I am an appreciator, appreciate, appreciator, appreciator of, of it. I am not super handy. <laughs> it, it may surprise you, but I am not super handy, especially when it comes to cosplay. Like, if I can find most of my things already made we're golden. We're good. <laughs> so yeah, like seeing people, like there was um, an Aloy, is that how you pronounce her name? I don't remember, from uh, Horizon. And she like made her bow and it looked beautiful. It was, it was amazing. You're hard sure because it's pretty close to how you dress normally. That you, you've just morphed into your character. That's all it is. I have never seen you two in the same room together, so I don't know what to tell you. You've fully embodied. <laughs> You've done two streams of Fellowship of the Ring. Yes. Two chapters in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It Finding that balance is uh, fun <laughs> to navigate, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I was lurking last night, Noodles. I was lurking, and it was great. Okay. I was walking around over the weekend, and while doing that, I stumbled upon a used bookstore, and they had really old books that I'm excited about. So I'm going to show you. So I picked up A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. And I'm really excited. I have not read this. I don't even know what it's about, but I have heard great things. <laughs> so I picked this up and it was great and I'm excited. So I will eventually be reading this on And I picked up Don Quixote. So now I don't have to read it um, on my tablet. And I can also show you the progress that we've made. It is very minimal. <laughs> also, okay, so this is how chunky it is. So we've got, we've read this far and we have this much to go. Wild. It's a good thing that we're enjoying it so far, right? <laughs> One man struggles to use. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, I am excited that I was able to, and also they had like a nicer copy and I was like, no, please give me the beat up copy that was purely, clearly loved. So I have the beat up really gross one <laughs> instead of picking up the like newer looking copy that was um probably never opened or maybe opened once but this one was definitely opened many times although i haven't found any like notes that have been written in it but that's cool it's fine maybe we will later so 
I was excited to find this. We'll also see, so the font is smaller and I can't like make it larger. So we'll see how my reading is with this. And can I show you the cutest little bookmark? I have a lot of cute bookmarks. I can't say which is my favorite, but I am glued. And it has a little fun little tassel on it. I've had this before. I didn't recently get it. I've only done part of one stream so far with the book around. Uh, yes, just one. So not bad. We're on page 58. See, now I can say page numbers, <laughs> which is cool. Uh, but yeah, we're on page 58. It reads pretty quickly, actually surprisingly yeah it's not bad progress it's not bad progress i think on the kindle it said that we were like i don't know like 10 percent something like that and i don't know okay so on the back of this book it does have uh whatchamacallits like notes and things like uh context yes uh, in about the book section and this copy also has footnotes, so that's cool. I may or may not say what the footnotes are, depending on if it gets in the way of what I'm reading. We'll see. We'll see. And if I can read it, because it's very tiny. The font is so stinking tiny. But yes, today we are starting with chapter eight. Uh, what have What happened last time? Well... It's about this guy named Don Quixote, and he ha he named himself Don Quixote, Don Quixote of La Mancha, and that was not his birth name, his given name. He has proclaimed himself this, and he has read a lot of books on chivalry and has decided that he is going to be a knight, and he is going to fight in wars, and he is going to win the hearts of many a maiden, and he's going to find true love, and in doing this <laughs> he is stumbling about <laughs> um he let's see what has happened so far not not too much has happened he's made it to like maybe like a neighboring town if that and stayed at an inn and in his mind he's like pretending that it's this castle and the innkeeper is you know the king and so he's been dubbed by the king as now being a knight and all of the like barkeep and uh the waitresses and stuff who were working in there were were ladies and things like that and he like renamed all of them to have very highfalutin sounding names and titles and he also like, ran into his neighbor, so clearly not that far away from home, ran into his neighbor, he comes back home, and people are very concerned about him, because he tried to joust? Am I getting that right? I don't remember. There was a conflict with somebody else, and he did a terrible job. He, like, fell over his horse and, like, hurt himself, so he ended up being taken back home, and the people at home are very concerned because of how he's acting, and so they are going through his books and they're just throwing it out the window to be burned because clearly this is where he's getting all of his, his deranged ideas and everything like that. Uh, and also to stop him from reading the books that they didn't have time to get rid of, they plaster and cemented the room that leads into his uh, bookshop all while he's like sleeping and passed out. But of course that doesn't stop him. So he wakes up, he talks to a neighbor and decides that this neighbor is going to be a squire and they are going on to a new adventure. No, he had a helmet, but it broke. So no, not, not the actual one. <laughs> Yay, book burnings. Exactly, exactly. Oh, noodles, yes. They have beautiful, beautiful cover designs. And yes, the font is for mice. There's no ex no other explanation. Only mice can read that book.
you remember that part distinctly. Um, Wadsworth, have you only read it in Spanish? Did you, have you, I think I asked you this last time. Have you also read it in English? You've never read it in English. Awesome. Very good. Okay, well, let's do it. And also, because I have a different edition, it is also a different translation. So this is a new translation by Edith Grossman. Which is ironic, because if all those books fell on a mouse, it would be a bad day. You have seen an English miniseries with John Lithgow. John Lithgow? Seriously? So good. So good. He plays such great characters. And the one that, like, I know he's done such great roles, and I'm probably going to get hate for this, but I distinctly remember him playing the Trinity Killer in Dexter. So good. Made me so uncomfortable. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Have a good one, Grouchy. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> All right. It was peak Dexter. Absolutely. Like, that, that season was my favorite. Absolutely. It used to be my uh, my mom's favorite show, which is so bizarre because she doesn't wa like watching anything that's su that's super, like, I don't know, like, graphic or uh, brutal or violent or anything like that, which is so funny. Um, or a lot of language, which there's definitely a lot in Dexter. But, yeah, so she has all of the seasons on DVD, and, like, that's how I watched it. <laughs> so good. Okay. See if I can read this. <laughs> Chapter 8. Again, we are on page 58. Let's do this. Regarding the good fortune of the valorous Don Quixote in the fearful and never-imagined adventure of the windmills, along with other events worthy of joyful remembrance. As they were talking, they saw thirty or forty of the windmills found in that countryside, and as soon as Don Quixote caught sight of them, he said to his squire, Good fortune is guiding our affairs better than we could have desired, for there you see, friend Sancho Panza, thirty or more enormous giants with whom I intend to do battle, and whose lives I intend to take, and with the spoils we shall begin our grow, begin to grow rich, for this is righteous warfare. And it is a great service to God to remove so evil a breed from the face of the earth. What giants? said Sancho Panza. Those you see over there, replied his master, with the long arms. Sometimes they are almost two leagues long. Look, your grace, Sancho responded. Those things that appear over there aren't giants, but windmills. And what looks like their arms are the sails that are turned by the wind and make the grindstone move. Seems clear to me, replied Don Quixote, that thou art not well versed in the matter of adventures. These are giants, and if thou art afraid, move aside and start to pray whilst I enter with them in fierce and unequal combat. And having said this, he spurred his horse, Rocinante, paying no attention to the shouts of his squire, Sancho, who warned him that, beyond any doubt, those things he was about to attack were windmills, and not giants. But he was so convinced they were giants, that he did not hear the shouts of his squire, Sancho, and could not see, though he was very close, that they really were. Instead, he charged and call out, called out, Flee not, cowards and base creatures, for it is a single knight who attacks you. Just then, a gust of wind began to blow, and the great sails began to move, and, seeing this, Don Quixote said, Even if you move more arms than the, the giant Briarius, you will answer me. And Briarius is a monstrous giant in Greek mythology who had fifty heads and a hundred arms, and that is terrifying. And saying this, 
and commending himself with all his heart to his lady Dulcinea, asking that she come to his aid at this critical moment, and well protected by his shield, with his lance in its socket. He charged to Rocinante's full gallop and attacked the first mill he came to, and as he thrust his lance into the sail, the wind moved it with so much force that it broke the lance into pieces and picked up the horse in the night, who then dropped to the ground and were very badly battered. Sancho Panza hurried to help as fast as his donkey could carry him, and when he reached them he discovered that Don Quixote could not move because he had taken so hard a fall with Rocinante. "'God save me,' said Sancho. "'Didn't I tell your grace to watch what you were doing, that these were nothing but windmills, and only somebody whose head was full of them wouldn't know that?' "'Be quiet, Sancho, my friend,' replied Don Quixote. Matters of war, more than any others, are subject to continual change, moreover, I think, and therefore it is true that the same Friston Ruiz, who stole my room and my books, has turned these giants into windmills in order to deprive me of the glory of defeating them. Such is the enmity he feels for me. But in the end, his evil arts will not prevail against the power of my virtuous sword." God's will be done, replied Sancho Panza. He helped him to stand, and Don Quixote remounted Rocinante, whose back was almost broken. And, talking about their recent adventure, they continued on the road to Puerto Lapis, an entrance to the mountains of the Sierra Morena between La Mancha and Andalusia. Because there, said Don Quixote, we could not fail to find many diverse adventures, since it was a very heavily trafficked place. But he rode heavy-hearted because he did not have his lance, and expressing this to his squire, he said, I remember reading that a Spanish knight named Diego Perez de Vargas, whose sword broke in battle, tore a heavy bough or branch from an oak tree, and with it did such great deeds that day and thrashed so many moors that he was called Machuca, the Bruiser, and from that day forward he and his descendants were named Vargas y Machuca. It is a historical figure of the 13th century. I have told you this because from the first oak that presents itself to me I intend to tear off another branch as good as the one I have in mind, and with it I shall do such great deeds that you will consider yourself fortunate for deserving to see them, and for being a witness to things that can hardly be believed. It's in God's hands, said Sancho. I believe everything your grace says, but sit a little straighter. It looks like you're tilting. It must be from the battery you took when you fell. That is true, replied Don Quixote. And if I do not complain about the pain, it is because it is not the custom of knights errant to complain about any wound, even if their innards are spilling out because of it. What comes to mind is, uh, <laughs> I, I, a flesh wound. <laughs> if that's true, I have nothing to say, Sancho responded. But God knows I'd be happy if your grace complained when something hurt you. As for me... I can say that I'll complain about the smallest pain I have, unless what you said about not complaining also applies to the squires of knights errant. Don Quixote could not help laughing at his squire's simple-mindedness, and so he declared that he could certainly complain however and whenever he wanted, with or without cause, for as yet he had not read anything to the contrary in the order of chivalry. Sancho said that it was time to eat. His master replied that he felt no need of food at the moment, but that Sancho could eat whenever he wished. With this permission, Sancho made himself as comfortable as he could on his donkey, and after taking out the saddlebags, what he had put into them, he rode behind his master at a leisurely pace, eating and, from time to time, tilting back the wineskin with so much gusto that the most self-indulgent tavern-keeper in Malaga might have envied him, and as he rode along in that matter, taking frequent drinks, he did not think about any promises his master had made him, 
and he did not consider it work but sheer pleasure to go around seeking adventures, no matter how dangerous they might be. Definite Black, vibe, black Knight vibes, yeah. <laughs> In short, they spent the night under some trees, and from one of them Don Quixote tore off a dry branch to use as a lance, and placed on it the iron head he had taken from the one that had broken. Don Quixote did not sleep at all that night, but thought of his lady Dulcinea in order to conform to what he had read in his books, of knights spending many sleepless nights in groves and meadows, turning all their thoughts to memories of their ladies. Sancho Panza did not do the same. Since his stomach was full and not with chicory water, he slept the entire night, and if his master had not called him, the rays of the sun shining in his face and the song of numerous birds joyfully greeting the arrival of the new day would have done nothing to rouse him. When he woke, he made another pass at the wineskin and found it somewhat flatter than it had been the night before, and his heart grieved, for it seemed to him they were not likely to remedy the lack very soon. Don Quixote did not wish to eat breakfast because, as has been stated, he meant to live on sweet memories. They continued on the road to Puerto Lapis, and at about three in the afternoon it came into view. Here, said Don Quixote when he saw it, we can, brother Sancho, Sancho, Pan, Sancho Panza, plunge our hands all the way up to the elbows into this thing they called adventures, but be advised that even if you see me in the greatest danger in the world, you are not to put a hand to your sword to defend me, unless you see that those who often offend me are base-born rabble, in which case you certainly can help me. But if you are a gentleman, under no circumstances is it licit or permissible for you, under the laws of chivalry, to help me until you are dubbed a knight. Nanaki, enjoy your lurk. There is no doubt, senor, replied Sancho, that your grace will be strictly obeyed in this. Besides, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a peaceful man and an enemy of getting involved in quarrels or disputes. It's certainly true that when it comes to defending my person, I won't pay much attention to the laws, since laws, both human and divine, permit each man to defend himself against anyone who tries to hurt him. I agree. Don Quixote responded. But as for helping me against gentlemen, you have to hold your natural impulses in check. Then that's what I'll do, replied Sancho, and I'll keep that pre precept as faithfully as I keep the Sabbath on Sunday. As they were speaking, there appeared on the road two Benedictine friars mounted on two dromedaries, for the two mules they rode on were surely no smaller than that. They wore their traveling masks and carried sunshades. Behind them came a carriage, accompanied by four or five men on horseback and two mule drivers on foot. In the carriage, as was learned later, was a Basque lady going to Sevilla, where her husband was preparing to sail for the Indies to take up a very honorable post. The friars were not traveling with her, although their route was the same. But as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, Either I am deceived, or this will be the most famous adventure ever seen, because those black shapes you see there must be, and no doubt are, enchanters who have captured some princess in that carriage, and I needs must do everything in my power to right this wrong. This will be worse than the windmills, said Sancho. Look, senor, those are friars of St. Benedict, and the carriage must belong to some traveler. Look carefully, I tell you. Look carefully at what you do, in case the devil is deceiving you. I have already told you, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, that you know very little about the subject of adventures. What I say is true, and now you will see that it is so. And having said this, he rode forward and stopped in the middle of the road that the friars were traveling, 
and when they were close enough so that he thought they could hear what he said, he called to them in a loud voice. You wicked and monstrous creatures, instantly unhand the noble princess you hold captive in that carriage, or else prepare to receive a swift death as just punishment for your evil deeds. The friar pulled on the reins, taken aback as much by Don Quixote's appearance as by his words, and they responded, Senor, we are neither wicked nor monstrous, but too religious of Saint Benedict, who are traveling on our way, and we do not know if there are captive princesses in that carriage or not. No soft words with me. I know who you are, perfidious rabble, said Don Quixote, and without waiting for another reply, he spurred Rocinante, lowered his lance, and attacked the first friar with so much ferocity and courage that it had not allowed himself to fall off the mule. The friar would have been thrown to the ground and seriously injured, or even killed. The second friar, who saw how his companion was treated, kicked his castle-sized mule and began to gallop across the fields, faster than the wind. Sancho Panza, who saw the men on the ground, quickly got off his donkey, hurried over to the friar, and began to pull off his habit. At this moment, two servants of the friars came over and asked why he was stripping him. Sancho replied that these clothes were legitimately his, the spoils of the battle his master, Don Quixote, had won. The servants had no sense of humor and did not understand anything about spoils or battles. And seeing that Don Quixote had moved away and was talking to the occupants of the carriage, they attacked Sancho and knocked him down, and leaving no hair in his beard unscathed, they kicked him breathless and senseless and left him lying on the ground. The friar, frightened and terrified and with no color in his face, did not wait another moment but got back on his mule, and when he was mounted, he rode off after his companion, who was waiting for him a good distance away wondering what the outcome of the attack would be. They did not wish to wait to learn how matters would turn out, but continued on their way, crossing themselves more than if they had the devil at their backs. Don Quixote, as has been said, was traveling to the lady in the carriage, saying, O oh, beauteous lady, thou canst do with thy person as thou wishest. For the arrogance of thy captors here lieth on the ground, vanquished by this my mighty arm, and so that thou mayest not pine to know the name of thy emancipator, know that I am called Don Quixote of La Mancha, knight-errant in search of adventures, and captive of the beauteous and peerless Doña Dulcinea of Toboso. And as recompense for the boon thou hast received from me, I desire only that thou turnest toward Toboso, and on my behalf appearest before this lady, and sayest unto her what deeds I have done to gain thy liberty. This is pretty great. Oh, fun fact. Okay, Cervantes originally left the ending open, and some other authors started publishing photo series that everyone hated, so Cervantes had to publish an epilogue. Ooh, that's cool. To prevent more falso Quixote. Amazing. That's really cool. I love stories like that. Thank you so much for sharing, Osborne. One of the squires accompanying the carriage was a Basque, who listened to everything that Don Quixote was saying, and seeing that he would not allow the carriage to move forward, but said it would have to go to Toboso, the squire approached Don Quixote and, seizing his lance, in bad Castilian and even worse Basque, he said, Go on, mister, you go wrong, by God who make me, if don't let carriage go, as I be Basque, I kill you. Don Quixote understood him very well and replied with great serenity, If you were a gentleman, as you are not, I would already have punished your foolishness and audacity, unhappy creature. To which the Basque replied, Not gentleman me. As Christian I make vow to God you lie. Throw away lance and pull out sword and soon see which one make horse drink. Basque by land, noble by sea, noble by devil, if say other things you lie. 
Oh, hello, Star. Hello. This book is massive. I know. I'm like trembling slightly. <laughs> it's it's a two-hand book. I feel like a little child holding it. <laughs> Facts. It is bigger than my head. Oh, almost bigger than my head. Close. <laughs> And now you will see, said Agrahas, a character, an Amidas of Gaul, would say these words before doing battle. It became a proverbial expression used at the beginning of a fight, replied Don Quixote. And after throwing his lance to the ground, he drew his sword, grasped his shield, and attacked the Basque, determined to take his life. The Basque, who saw him coming at him in this manner, wanted to get off the mule, which being one of the inferior ones for hire, could not be trusted. But all he could do was draw his sword. It was his good fortune, however, to be next to the carriage, and he seized one of the pillows and used it as the shield, and the two of them went at each other as if they were mortal enemies. The rest of the people tried to make peace between them, but could not, because the Basque who said in his tangled words that if they did not allow him to finish his fight, he himself would kill his mistress and everyone else who got in his way. The lady in the carriage, stunned and fearful at what she saw, had the coachman drive some distance away, and from there she watched the fiercest, the fierce contest in the course of which the Basque went over Don Quixote's shield and struck a great blow with his sword to his shoulder, and if it had not been protected by armor, he would have opened it to the waist. Don Quixote, who felt the pain of that enormous blow, gave a great shout, saying, "'O oh, lady of my soul, Dulcinea, flower of beauty, come to the aid of this thy knight, who, for the sake of thy great virtue, finds himself in grave peril.'" Saying this, and grasping his words, his sword, and protecting himself with his shield, and attacking the bosk, were all one, for he was determined to venture everything on the fortune of a single blow. Such a ham. I love it. <laughs> the Basque, seeing him attack in this fashion, clearly understood the courage of this rash act, and resolved to do the same as Don Quixote. And so he waited for him, shielded by his pillow and unable to turn the mule one way or the other, for the mule utterly exhausted and not made for such foolishness, could not take another step. I love imagining the mule just being so fed up and just like, no man, I'm not gonna move. I'm just staying right here. <laughs> as has been said, as has been said, Don Quixote was charging the wear basque with his sword on high, determined to cut him in half. And the basque, well protected by his pillow, was waiting for him, his sword also raised, and all the onlookers were filled with fear and suspense regarding the outcome of the great blows they threatened to give to each other, and the lady in the carriage and all her maids were making a thousand vows and offerings to all the images and houses of devotion in Spain, so that God would deliver the squire and themselves from the great danger in which they found themselves. But the difficulty in all this is that at this very point and juncture, the author of the history leaves the battle pending, apologizing because he found nothing else written about the feats of Don Quixote other than what he has already recounted. It is certainly true that the second author of his work did not want to believe that so curious a history would be subjected to the laws of oblivion, so that the great minds of La Mancha possessed so little interest that they did not have in their archives or writing tables a few pages that dealt with this famous knight, and so, with this thought in mind, he did not despair of finding the conclusion to this gentle history, which, with heaven's help, he discovered in the manner that will be revealed in part two. Ooh, a little tease! <laughs> Okay, and there's two notes here. I just didn't want to interrupt the sentence. So, second author has a, a note, and it says, The second author is Cervantes, that is, the narrator, who claims in the following chapter to have arranged for the translation of another fictional author's book, 
This device was common in novels of chivalry. And then also there is a note uh, after he discovered in the manor that will be revealed in part two. It says, Cervantes originally divided the 1605 novel, commonly called the first part of Don Quixote, into four parts. The break in the narrative action between parts was typical of novels in chivalry. I love that it is also written in the same manner of the books of chivalry books because that is clearly what Don Quixote is obsessed with. And I love that Sancho is not like seeing or like having the same imagination that Don Quixote is, but he's in it because Don Quixote promised him land and like riches and he can have like he can rummage through raid through all of the the uh, bodies and through the towns and stuff like that that they, that they conquer which he does do and when questioned he's like um these are mine now like my master just won this battle it still brains your bend to think that or brains your bend bends your brain to think that Cervantes and Shakespeare were contemporaries <gasps> interesting digressions galore yes also Neo Dainty, hello. Good to see you. That's wild. Cervantes and Shakespeare. Interesting, interesting. I hate it when my when I brain my bend. Same, same Danny. Also, hello. <laughs> I love when my mind just mixes all of the words together. That right there is an example of braining my bend. Also, that was the end of the chapter. And we're starting part two. Of the ingenious gentleman, Don Quixote of La Mancha. All right. Chapter nine. In which the stupendous battle between the gallant Basque and the, val and the valiant Manchegan is concluded and comes to an end. I, so the jury was out the first read for the first uh, seven chapters, but I'm getting into it now and it's pretty great. The humor is spot on and I just love it. I'm loving it so far. Manchego is definitely quality cheese. I see no lies. <laughs> you are 1000% correct. What I have been eating a lot of Munster cheese. Delightful. Like getting a block of Munster and like chopping it up, putting it with a cracker or just nibbling on it like you're a little mouse. Delightful. The theme of the comments today are mice. I've mentioned mice several times. Don't know why. Just mice on the brain, I guess. I did have a mix. Yes, yes. And Munster was part of that snack plate. I'm not gonna lie. It was sharp cheddar, Munster, and pepper jack. I also love pepper jack. Ooh. Ooh. Delicious. And you're reminding me that it's been a while since I've been to Wisconsin and I need some more cheese. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to make a trip soon. <laughs> Barely into Wisconsin. Just enough to go to the uh, the Cheese Castle. That's all I need. That's all I need in my life. Just stop a quick stop at the Cheese Castle. Get some cheese. And I'm a happy, I'm a happy camper. If you can find red Real peppers, formerly in a jar. You can stuff them with manchego and roast them in the oven with olive oil. Oh, that sounds like everything that I want. <laughs> Wadsworth, that sounds amazing. It's your favorite, a classic Spanish dish, and it's your favorite. That sounds so, so good. It sounds like something that I should be sharing with people at like when people come over, it's like, oh, look at my my fancy little Spanish dish. But 1,000% something that I'm just going to make for myself. 
and eat all of it. It's a tablet. Yeah. Oh, tablets. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You live too far away to make a casual trip to Wisconsin. Yes. Cheese and cheese accessory. <laughs> That is unfortunate, Star. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I love tapas. I love tapas. I love them so much. And again, I can't remember the last time I ate tapas. I have a cookbook that is for tapas. But, oh, maybe it has this in it. Wait, I don't know. I don't know. I think the last time I used it, I made like a stuffed mushroom. Little, little, little dish. You think it's in the cookbook? Okay, I'm gonna have to look for it because I tacos are high tier food. Yes, they are. I see absolutely no lies in that statement. That is a pure fact. <laughs> I love tacos. I was uh, talking about Taco Bell earlier today and I can't remember the last time I had Taco Bell, but I want it. And I know that tacos, that Taco Bell isn't like tacos. <laughs> But it's good. Don't even get me started on burritos. <laughs> Delightful. Delightful. Exactly. Taco Bell is its own food ca food category. It has its own little square in a in the uh, food pyramid. Worlds of confusion. You've never had a taco? Oh, one day. And it will be glorious. And there will be no going back. <laughs> You grew up with the actual Mexican clean food, so you can't do Taco Bell. That's fair. That's fair. I did not. <laughs> I distinctly remember when, this is going to age me, but I remember when uh, Crunchwrap Supremes first came out and they had the commercials for it and going there and loving it. And I've never gone back. I mostly just get Crunchwrap Supremes with Baja Blast and side tacos. Spanish restaurants will have like 50 choices for tapas. Yes, 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 yes. Mm hmm. And you like share them. It's wonderful. We're gonna make it my first taco. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. Danny, I remember that chihuahua. <laughs> oh, that terrible, terrible chihuahua. <laughs> I remember all of these things for I am 100 years old. I'm just a bog witch and stay so youthful by drinking the blood of my enemies. <laughs> all right. That being said, <laughs> chapter nine. <laughs> if your book doesn't have the recipe, we go to Okay, San Andres. Excellent. And I'm sure I can find it. I will be looking, though. Because that sounds delightful. Was their mascot a chihuahua? Or did they have a chihuahua taco? Oh, no, world's confusion. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's great. It's just like collagen. <laughs> Good for your skin. <laughs> And that's how you make it look so, so vibrant. <laughs> if we found out that you were a powerful master of the arcane arts, my first reaction would be, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I play it off as a joke, but... <laughs> okay, it has to be those specific peppers. Excellent. Okay. Ooh, they're sweet. Okay. That's fun. I'll have to see if I can find those, too. Before I get too, too excited. Oh my gosh, you guys are making me hungry. I had a snack before coming on, but I'm hungry again. It's okay. Alright, chapter 9. We'll talk about tacos later. <laughs> we do need a command for food talk, yes. I could literally talk about food. For forever. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'm glad it's not just a me. 
<laughs> okay, chapter nine, in which the stupendous battle between the gallant Basque and the valiant Menchagan is concluded and comes to an end. In part one of this history, we left the brave Basque and his famous Don Quixote with their swords raised and unsheathed, about to deliver two downstrokes so furious that if they had entirely hit the mark, their combatants would have been cut and split in half from top to bottom and opened like pomegranates. And at that extremely uncertain point, the delectable history stopped and was interrupted without the author giving us any information as to where the missing parts could be found. Chorad de comida. <laughs> also, I love the, like, meta-ness of this. So good. This caused me a good deal of grief, because the pleasure of having read so small an amount was turning into displeasure at the thought of the difficult road that lay ahead in finding the large amount that, in my opinion, was missing from so charming a tale. It seemed impossible and completely contrary to all good precedent that so good a knight should have lacked a wise man who would assume the responsibility of recording his never-before-seen deeds, something that never happened to other knights errant, the ones that people say go searching for adventures. Because each of them had one or two wise men whose purpose was not only to record their deeds, but to depict their slightly slightest thoughts and fancies, no matter how secret they might be, and so good a knight could not be so fortunate as to lack that Platier and others like him had in abundance. Okay, we have two. <laughs> He's not like other knights. <laughs> we have two footnotes. Okay, the first one was after the lines, um, the ones that people say go searching for adventures, and it says, these lines, probably taken from a ballad, appeared in Alvar Gomez's Spanish translation of Petrarch's Triomphi, although nothing comparable is in the Italian original. And then we have the note after Platier and others like him had in abundance, and that says, a commonplace in chivalric fiction was that the knight's adventures, Platier's, for example, had been recorded by a wise man and then translated, the translation being the novel. I feel like a lot of these, we need the, like, the more you know thing. I keep saying that. I'm pretty sure I've said that ever since I've started reading. It'll happen one day. And therefore, I was not inclined to believe that so gallant a history had been left maimed and crippled, and I blamed the malignity of time the devourer and consumer of all things, who had either hidden it away or consumed it. On the other hand, it seemed to me that since works as modern as Deceptions of Jealousy and Nymphs and Shepherds of Parnares, Canars, had been found among Don Quixote's books, his history, was also, his history also had to be modern, and though it might not be written down, it had to live on in the memories of people his village and from other villages nearby. And we have a note from the Shepherd's Book, and it was published, oh, from both the books, published in 1586 and 1587, respectively. So that's cool that they're uh, referencing actual books. That's fun. This thought left me disconcerted and longing to know, really and truly, and in its entirety, the life and miracles of our famous Spaniard, Don Quixote of La Mancha, the model and paragon of Manchegan chivalry, and the first in our age, and in these calamitous times, calamitous, there we go, calamitous times, to take up the exercise and profession of chivalric arms, righting wrongs, defending widows, and protecting those maidens who rode, with whips and palfreys, and bearing all their virginity on their backs from mountain to mountain and valley to valley, and unless some villain, or some farmer, with hatchet and pitchfork, or some enormous giant forced her, a maiden could, in days of yore, after eighty years of never once sleeping under a roof, go to her grave as pure as the day her mother bore her. 
yo, why is time so malignant, bruh? <laughs> Perfect translation. I say, then, that for these and many other reasons, our gallant Don Quixote is deserving of continual and memorable praise, as am I, on account of the toil and effort I have put into finding the conclusion of this amiable history, though I know very well that if heaven, circumstances, and fortune do not assist me, the world will be deprived of the almost two hours of entertainment and pleasure the attentive reader may derive from it. This is how I happened to find it. One day, when I was in the Akana market in Toledo, a boy came by to sell some notebooks and old papers to a silk merchant. As I am very fond of reading even torn papers in the streets, I was moved by my natural inclinations to pick up one of the volumes the boy was selling, and I saw that it was written in characters I knew to be Arabic, and since I recognized but could not read it, I looked around to see if some Morisco who knew Castilian could read it for me, was in the vicinity, and it was not very difficult to find this kind of interpreter, for even if I had sought a speaker of a better and older language, I would have found him. And we have two notes here. Morisco, a Moor, who had been converted to Christianity, and better and older language, in allusion to Hebrew, spoken by Jewish folks who were merchants. There you go. In short, fortune provided me with one, and when I told him what I wanted and placed the book in his hands, he opened it in the middle, read for a short while, and began to laugh. I asked him why he was laughing, and he replied that it was because of something written in the margin of the book as an annotation. I told him to tell me what it was, and he, still laughing, said, As I have said, here in the margin is written, this Dulcinea of Toboso, referred to so often in this history, they say had the best hand for salting pork of any woman in all of La Mancha. When I heard him say Dulcinea Toboso, I was astonished and filled with anticipation, for it occurred to me that those volumes contained the history of Don Quixote. With this thought in mind, I urged him to read the beginning, which he did, extemporizing a translation of the Arabic into Castilian, and saying that it said, History of Don Quixote of La Mancha, written by Sid Hamet Bengali, Benengali, an Arab historian. And there is a note here. Sid is the equivalent of Senor. Hamate is the Arabic name of Hamid. Benengali means eggplant. <laughs> A favorite food of Spanish Moors and Jews, uh, J Jewish folks, in chapter 2 of the second volume, 1615, the first author is in fact referred to as Sid Hamete Berengena. There you go. All these little notes to help you with your, your papers that you're writing diligently. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Okay. I immediately went to the Morisco, to the cloister of the main church, and asked him to render the journals, all those that dealt with Don Quixote, into the Castilian language, without taking away or adding anything to them, offering him whatever payment he might desire. He was satisfied with two arrobas of raisins and two fenagas of wheat. That is approximately 50 pounds and three bushels. Oh, and it's a little more than three bushels. And he promised to translate them well and faithfully and very quickly. But to facilitate the arrangement and not allow such a wonderful find out of my hands, I brought him to my house, where, in a little more than a month and a half, he translated the entire history, just as it is recounted here. In the first notebook, there was a very realistic depiction of the Battle of Don Quixote with the Basque, both in the postures recounted in the history, their swords, their swords raised, 
one covered by his round shield, the other by his pillow, and the Basque's mule so lifelike that at the distance of crossbow shot one could see that it was the mule for hire. At the mule's feet was the caption that read, Don Sancho de As Aspetia, which, no doubt, was the Basque's name, and at the feet of Rosinante was another that said, Don Quixote. Oh my gosh, star, I do not. But it sounds great. <laughs> Rosinante was so wonderfully depicted, so long and lank, so skinny and lean, with so prominent a backbone and an appearance so obviously consumptive that it was clear with what foresight and accuracy he had been given the name Rosinante. Next to him was Sancho Panza, holding the halter of his donkey, and at its feet was another caption that said, Sancho Zancas. And as the picture showed, he must have had a big belly, short stature, and long shanks, and for this reason he was given the name Panza, as well as Zancas, for from time to time the history calls him by both of these surnames. A few other details were worthy of notice, but they are of little importance and relevance to the true account of this history, for no history is bad if it is true. If any objection can be raised regarding the truth of this one, it can only be that its author was Arabic, since the people of that nation are very prone to telling falsehoods. That's not cool. But because they are such great enemies of ours, it can be assumed that he has given us too little rather than too much. So it appears to me, for when he could and should have wielded his pen to praise the virtues of so good a knight, it seems he intentionally passes over them in silence. This is something badly done and poorly thought out, since historians must and ought to be exact, truthful, and absolutely free of passions, for neither interest, fear, rancor, nor affection should make them deviate from the path of the truth, whose mother is history, the rival of time, repository of great deeds, witness to the past, example and adviser to the present, and forewarning to the future." It is an interesting thought. I think it is uh, that history is is no history is bad if it were true. That's pretty interesting to think about, and I'm sure it could be extrapolated in 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 just so many different ways. And it's also interesting um, the discussion of like that that you shouldn't deviate from the path of truth when truth is like so hard to pinpoint because it depends on like perspective <laughs> like there's always three sides to an argument right like your side their side and what actually happened and i feel like that's uh goes along with finding the truth because we're all biased perhaps a hot take history is far more subjective than anyone gives credit for i agree with you i agree with you i mean you think about who writes all of the history books and it's the people who won the war so yeah, of course, of course, everything everything is slated. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. In this account, I know there will be found everything that could be rightly desired in the most pleasant history. And if something of value is missing from it, in my opinion, the fault lies with the dog who was its author, rather than with any defect in its subject. In short, its second part, according to the translation, began in this manner with the sharp edge at with the sharp edged swords of the two valiant and enraged combatants held and raised on high they seemed to threaten heaven earth and the abyss such was their boldness and bearing the first to strike a blow was the choleric the choleric excuse me the choleric basque and he delivered it with so much force and fury that if his sword had not turned on its way down, that single blow would have been enough to end this fierce combat and all the adventures of our knight. But good fortune, which had greater things in store for Don Quixote, twisted the sword of his adversary, so that although it struck his left shoulder, it did no more than tear through the armor along that side, taking with it as it passed a good part of his helmet and half an ear, both of which, in fearful ruin, fell to the ground, 
leaving him in a very sad state. Surely the internet will depict things accurately these days. I mean, I read something on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> Lord save me, who can accurately tell of the rage that now filled the heart of our Manchegan, Manchegan when he saw himself so mistreated? Suffice it to say, it was so great that he stood again in the stirrups and grasping his sword in both hands, he struck his opponent with so much fury, hitting him square on his pillow and his head, that despite those good defenses, and as if a mountain had fallen on him, the basque began to bleed from his nose, mouth, and ears, and to show signs of falling off the mule, and he would have fallen, no doubt, if he had not been, if he had not thrown his arms around the animal's neck, but even so, his feet slipped out of the stirrups, and his arms loosened, and the mule, terrified by the awful blow, began to run across the field and, after bucking a few times, threw his rider to the ground. Don Quixote watched very carefully, very calmly, and when he saw him fall, he leaped from his horse, raced over to him, placed the tip of his sword between the Basque's eyes, and ordered him to surrender, or else he would cut off his head. Basque was so stunned, he could not say a word. And he would have come to a bad end, given Don Quixote's blind rage, if the ladies in the carriage, who until that moment had watched the battle with great dismay, had not approached him, and implored him most earnestly that he do them the favor and grant them the boon of sparing the life of their squire. To which Don Quixote responded with pride and gravity. Hey, Infin Infinite Gamer, welcome in. Hello, hi. Certainly, beauties, ladies, I am very happy to do as you ask, but it must be with a condition and a stipulation, and it is that this knight must promise to go to Toboso and present himself on my behalf to the peerless Doña Dulcin Dulcinea, so that she may do with him as she pleases. The frightened and distressed ladies, without considering what Don Quixote was demanding, and without asking who Dulcinea was, promised that the squire would do everything he was ordered to do. With confidence in that promise, I shall do him no more harm, although he is rich, although he so richly deserves it. End of the chapter. It's a good story. You've read it before. I have not read it before, and I am really enjoying it so far. I really am. All right. Chapter 10. Do you know Spanish? Thank you. Um, there was a time when I spoke Spanish, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I minored in Spanish in college. And then because I didn't really talk to anybody in Spanish or continue reading in Spanish or anything like that, it sort of slipped away. But thank you very much. All right. Chapter 10. Concerning what further beheld Don Quixote and the Basque and the danger in which he found himself and the band of the Glacians from Anbois, Yanwas. And then there's a note that says, Cervantes apparently divided this portion of the text into chapters after he had written it, and he did so in haste. The adventures with the Basque is concluded, and the Galicians do not appear for another five chapters. That's great. That's a fun footnote. <laughs> By this time, Sancho Panza, badly treated, rather... We're going to start that sentence over. By this time, Sancho Panza, rather badly treated by the servants of the friars, had gotten to his feet and was paying close attention to the battle waged by his master and imploring God in his heart that it would be his will to grant Don Quixote a victory in which he would win an insula and make Sancho the governor, and as he had promised. Seeing, then, that the combat had ended and his master was about to rem remount Resonante, he came to hold the stirrups for him, 
and before Don Quixote mounted, Sancho fell to his knees before him, and grasping his hand, he kissed it and said, May it please your grace, Señor Don Quixote, to give me the governorship of the, of the insula that you have won in this fierce combat, for no matter how big it may be, I feel I have the ability to govern it just as well as anyone else who has ever governed insulas in this world. To which Don Quixote replied, Let me point out, Brother Sancho, that this adventure and those like it are adventures not of insulas, but of crossroads, in which nothing is won but a broken head or a missing ear. Have patience, for adventures will present themselves in which you can become not only a governor, but perhaps even more. Sancho thanked him profusely, and after kissing his hand again and the skirt of his cuirass, he helped him to remount Rocinante, and then he mounted his donkey and began to follow his master, who, at a rapid pace, without saying goodbye or speaking any further with the ladies in the carriage, rode into a nearby wood. Sancho followed as fast as his jackass would go, but Rocinante moved so quickly that the squire, seeing himself left behind, was obliged to call to his master to wait for him. Don Quixote did so, pulling on Rocinante's reins until his weary squire caught up to him, and when he did, Sancho said, "'It seems to me, senor, that it would be a good idea for us to take refuge in some church, for that man you fought was so badly injured that it won't be long before he tells the Holy Brotherhood what happened, and they'll arrest us, and by my faith, if they do, before we get out of prison, they'll put us through a terrible time.' And Holy Brotherhood was an armed force that policed the countryside of the roads. Be quiet, said Don Quixote. Where have you ever seen or read that a knight errant has been brought before the law, no matter how many homicides he has ever committed? I don't know anything about homicides replied Sancho, and I never did bear one in my life. All I know is that the Holy Brotherhood takes care of people who fight in the countryside, and I don't want anything to do with that. And then homicils, he confuses homicidios, which is homicides, with homicios, which is grudges. Well, do not trouble yourself, my friend, Don Quixote responded, for I shall save you from the hands of the child chaldeans not to mention those of the brotherhood but tell me as you value your life have you ever seen a more valiant knight than i anywhere on the face of the earth have you read in histories of another who has or ever had more spirit in attacking more courage in persevering more dexterity in wounding or more ingenuity in unhorsing the truth is replied sancho that I never read any history, because I don't know how to read or write. But I'll wager that in all my days I've never served a bolder master than your grace, and may it please God that all this boldness isn't paid for in the place, I said. What I beg for your grace is that we treat your wounds. A lot of blood is coming out of that ear, and I have some lint and a little white salve here in the saddlebags. Lint was used in much the same way that an absorbent cotton was in modern medicine. <laughs> None of that would be needed, replied Don Quixote, if I had remembered to prepare a flask of the balm of Fierabras? Fierabras? For just one drop saves both time and medicine. "'What flask and what balm is that?' asked Sancho Panza. "'It is a balm,' replied Don Quixote. "'The recipe for which I have memorized, and with it one need not fear death, "'not think that one will die of any wound. "'When I prepare it and give it to you, all you need do, "'when you see in some battle that they have cut my body in two, "'as it won't, as it won't to happen, "'is to pick up the part of my body that has fallen to the ground, "'and very artfully, and with great cunning, before the blood congeals, place it on top of the other half, still in the saddle, being careful to fit them together precisely and exactly. Then you will give me only two mouthfuls to drink of the palm I have mentioned, and you will see me sounder than an apple. If that is true, said Panza, 
I renounce here and now the governorship of the insula you have promised, and want nothing else in the payment for my many good services, but that your grace give me the recipe for this marvellous potion, for I think an ounce of it will bring more than two reales anywhere, and I don't need more than that to live an easy and an honourable life. But what I'd like to know now is if it costs a lot to make. With less than three reales you can make more than six azumbres, replied Don Quixote. An azumbre was the equivalent of a little more than two liters. Poor sinner that I am, said Sancho, what is your grace waiting for? Why don't you make it and show me how it is done? Be quiet, my friend, Don Quixote responded, for I intend to show you greater secrets and do you greater good turns. For now, let us treat these wounds, for my ear hurts more than I should like. Sancho took lint and salve out of the saddlebags, but when Don Quixote saw that his helmet had been broken, he thought he would go mad, and placing his hand on his sword and lifting his eyes to heaven, he said, I make a vow to the Creator of all things, and to the four holy gospels in the fullness of their writing, that I shall lead the life led by the great Marquis of Mantua, when he swore to avenge the death of his nephew, Valdovinos, which was to eat no bread at the table, nor to lie with his wife, and other things which I do not remember, but I consider them stated here, until I take my entire revenge on the one who has done me so great a wrong. Hola, Captain Hardship. Welcome in. Hello. On hearing this, Sancho said, Look, Your Grace, Señor Don Quixote, if the gentleman did what you ordered him to, to and went to present himself to my lady Dulcinea of Toboso, then he has already done what he had to do and doesn't deserve another punishment if he doesn't commit another crime. Hmm. You have spoken very well and to the point, Don Quixote responded. And so I revoke the part of the vow that deals with wreaking new vengeance on him, but I make it and confirm it again with regard to leading the life I mentioned. A little dance break. Just Lisa, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome in. Glad you're here. <laughs> we'll just start that sentence over. <laughs> you have spoken very well and to the point. Don Quixote responded, and so I revoke the part of the vow that deals with wreaking new vengeance on him, but I make it and confirm it again with regard to leading the life I mentioned until such time that I take by force another helmet, just as good as this one, from another knight. And do not think, Sancho, that I do this without reflection, for I have a good model to emulate. The same thing happened in exactly the same way with regard to the helmet of Mambrino, which cost... Sacrapante, so dearly. And there is a footnote, and it says, loosely based on an episode of Aristos Orlando Furioso, in which Rinaldos de Monta Monta Montaban takes the enchanted helmet of the Moorish king Mambrino from Dardanelle and kills him in the process. Well, there you go. Your grace should send such vows to the devil, senor, replied Sancho, for they are very dangerous to your health and very damaging to your conscience. If not, then tell me, if for many days we don't happen to run into a man armed with a helmet, what will we do? Must we keep the vow in spite of so many inconveniences and discomforts, like sleeping in our clothes and sleeping in the open and a thousand other acts of penance contained in the vow of that crazy old man of the Marquis of Mantua, which your grace wants to renew now? Look, your grace, no armed men travel along these roads, only mule drivers and wagon drivers, and they not only don't have helmets, but maybe they haven't even heard of them on all their days. Oh! <laughs> In this you are deceived, said Don Quixote. Because in less than two hours' time, at these crossroads, we shall see more armed men than those who besieged Albraca when Angelica the Fair was defeated. And there's a footnote, a reference to an episode of, oh my gosh, Boyardo's Orlando Inamorato, in which 
Agricane's army, consisting of 2,200,000 knights, laid siege to Albraca. All right, then. So be it, said Sancho. May it please God that all goes well with us, and the time comes soon when we win the insula that is costing me so dear, and then I can die. I have already told you, Sancho, that you should have no care in the regard. If an insula is lacking, there is already the kingdom of Denmark, or that of Soliadisa, which will fit you like a ring on your finger, all because they are on terra firma. You ought to rejoice even more. But all of this is due course. Look and see if you have anything to eat in those saddlebags, and then we shall go in search of a castle where you can stay the night and prepare the balm I told you of, because I swear before God that my ear is hurting a good deal. <laughs> really old memories percolating up, only in another language. <laughs> I have here an onion and a little cheese, and I don't know how many crusts of bread said Sancho, but these are not victuals suitable for a knight as valiant as your grace. How little you understand, Don Quixote responded. I shall tell you, Sancho, that it is a question of honor for knights errant not to eat for a month, and when they do eat, it is whatever they find near at hand, and you would know the truth of this if you had read as many histories as I, although there are many of them, and none have I found written that knights errant ever ate unless perhaps at some sumptuous banquet offered in their honor. The rest of the time they all but fasted, although it is understood that they could not live without eating or doing all the other necess necessities of nature, because, in fact, they were men like ourselves. It must also be understood that because they spent most of their lives in the open, unpopulated countryside, without a cook, their most common food would be rustic viands, like those which you offer me now. And so, Sancho, my friend, do not concern yourself with what may or may not be to my taste. You should not try to make the world over again, or change the nature of errant chivalry. Dang it, Sancho. Give me the onion and cheese. <laughs> and fix my ear. <laughs> Forgive me, your grace said Sancho. Since I don't know how to read or write as I told you before, I don't know and am not aware of the rules of the chivalric profession. From now on, I'll stock the saddlebags with all kinds of dried fruits for your grace, since you are a knight. And for me, since I am not, I'll fill them with other things that have wings and are more substantial. <laughs> I am not saying, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, that it is necessary for knights errant not to eat anything other than those fruits you mention, but simply that their most ordinary sustenance consisted of them and of certain plants found in the fields, which were known to them, and to me as well. Oh, it's a great virtue, San Sancho responded, to know those plants, for I am thinking that one day we'll need to use that knowledge. Foreshadowing, is it? He took out the things he said he was carrying, and they ate in peace and good companionship. But they wanted to find a place to sleep that night, and they quickly finished their dry and meager meal. Then they climbed back on their mounts and hurried to reach a village before dark, but the sun set, along with the hope of achieving their desire, when they were near the huts of some goat herds, and so they decided to spend the night there, as much as it grieved Sancho not to be in a town. It pleased his master to sleep outdoors, for it seemed to him that each time this occurred, it was another act of certification that helped to prove his claim to knighthood. Your Grace, you can eat handfuls of peanuts. I am going to have a quail or two for dinner. Enjoy. <laughs> That's great. I. This is actually way funnier than I thought it was going to be. So I knew that it was going to be funny. I have heard a lot of different people say that it is funny, but because it is so stinking old, I was like, oh, the humor's gonna change. I'm not gonna think it's funny. I have read older books that were supposed to be funny, and I just, like, didn't get it. Like, but I, I get it, and I'm laughing, and I like it. <laughs> so that was the end of chapter 10. So good.
old humor always has, yes, a 45% chance of being cringe today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what this humor does, it's like the like writing style that's pretty great. It's like a dry humor. And also the humor isn't punching down, which is so good. And I feel like a lot of older humor does punch down and it's just not, it's just not funny. I mean, it's not, oops. It's not funny today. Probably wasn't funny then, but here we are. Really super windy. And we have like this little box for keeping like our um like patio cushions and stuff. I was looking outside and it just like flew open. And then, like, flew closed and then flew open and was like, what is going on out there? Was hailing earlier today, too. So, if you're experiencing weather today, I hope you're all safe. I hope your cars are okay, too. Wild. Alright. Chapter 11. <laughs> Regarding what befell Don Quixote with some goat herds. He was welcomed cheerfully by the goat herds, and Sancho, having done his best to tend to Rocinante and his donkey, followed the aroma coming from certain pieces of dried goat meat that were bubbling over the fire in a pot. And though he wished at that very moment to test if they were ready to be transferred from the pot to his stomach, he did not, because the goat herds moved, from, moved them from the fire, spread some sheepskins on the ground, quickly prepared their rustic table, and with displays of goodwill invited them both to share what they had. The six of them, which was the number of their flock, sat down around the skins, having first with artless ceremony asked Don Quixote to sit on a small wooden trough that they turned upside down and set it out for them. Don Quixote sat down, and Sancho remained standing to serve him and fill his cup, which was made of horn. His master saw him standing and said. Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So that you may see, Sancho, the virtue contained in knight errantry, and how those who practice any portion of it always tend to be honored and esteemed in the world. I want you to sit here at my side, and in the company of these good people, and be the same as I, who am I your natural lord and master? Eat from my plate, and drink where I drink, for one may say of knight-errantry what is said of love. It makes all things equal. You're too kind, said Sancho, but I can tell your grace that as long as I have something good to eat, I'll eat it just as well or better standing and all alone as sitting at the height of an emperor. Besides, if truth be told, what I eat even if it's bread and onion, tastes much better to me in my corner without fancy and respectful manners than a turkey would at other tables where I have to chew slowly, not drink too much, wipe my mouth a lot, not sneeze or cough if I feel like it, or do other things that come with solitude and freedom. And so, Signor, these honors that your grace wants me, wants to grant me for being a servant and follower of knight errantry, which I am, being your grace's squire, you should turn into other things that will be of greater comfort and benefit to me. These, though I am grateful for them, I renounce now and forever. That's hilarious. He's like, mm, no, I kind of just want to not. I don't want to have manners. Despite all that, you will sit down. For God exalts the man who humbles himself. And seizing him by the arm, he obliged Sancho to sit next to him. The goat herds did not understand their nonsensical talk about squires and knights errant, and they simply ate and were silent and looked at their guests, who, with a good deal of grace and eagerness, devoured pieces of goat meat as big as their fists. When the meat course was over, the goat herds spread out on the unshorn sheepskins, a great quantity of dried acorns, a 
along with half a cheese that was harder than mortar. And all this time, the horn was not idle, for it made the rounds so often, sometimes full, sometimes empty, like the bucket at will, that often, that one of the two wineskins in evidence was emptied with no difficulty. After Don Quixote had satisfied his stomach, he picked up a handful of acorns and, regarding them attentively, he began to speak these words. Fortunate the age and fortunate the times called golden by the ancients, and not because gold, which is in our age of iron is so highly esteemed, could be found then with no effort, but because those who lived in that time did not know the two words fine and mine. In that blessed age all things were owned in common. No one, for his daily sustenance, needed to do more than lift his hand and pluck it from the sturdy oaks that so liberally invited him to share their sweet and flavorsome fruit. The clear fountains and rushing rivers offered delicious, transparent waters in magnificent abundance. In the fissures of rocks and the hollows of trees, diligent and clever bees established their colonies, freely offering to any hand the fertile harvest of their sweet labor. Noble cork trees, moved only by their own courtesy, shed the wide light bark with which houses, supported on rough posts, were covered as a protection, but only against the rain that fell from heaven. In that time, all was peace, friendship, and harmony. The heavy curve of the plowshare had not yet dared to open or violate the merciful womb of our first mother, for she, without being forced, offered up, everywhere across her broad and fertile bosom, whatever would satisfy, sustain, and delight the children who then possessed her. In that time, simple and beautiful shepherdess, shepherdesses, could wander from valley to valley and hill to hill, their hair hanging loose or in braids, wearing only the clothes needed to modestly cover that which modesty demands, and has always demanded, be covered. And their adornments were not those used now, enveloping the one who wears them in the purple dyes of tear, the silk martyrized in countless ways, but a few green burdock leaves and ivy vines entwined, and in these they perhaps looked as grand and elegant as our ladies of the court do now in the rare and strange designs which idle curiosity has taught them. In that time, amorous concepts were recited from the soul simply and directly, in the same way and manner that the soul conceived them, without looking for artificial and devious words to enclose them. There was no fraud, deceit, or malice mixed in with honesty and truth. Justice stood on her own ground, and favor or interest did not dare disturb or offend her as they so often do now, defaming, confusing, and persecuting her. Arbitrary opinions formed outside the law had not yet found a place in the mind of the judge, for there was nothing to judge, and no one to be judged. Maidens in their modesty wandered, as I have said, wherever they wished, alone, and mistress of themselves, without fear that another's boldness or lasciviousness, lascivious intent, would dishonor them, and if they fell, it was through their own desire and will. By now, in these our detestable times, no maiden is safe, even if she is hidden and enclosed in another labyrinth like the one in Crete, because even there, through chinks in the wall or carried by the the air itself, with the zealousness of a cursed solicitation, the amorous pestilence finds its way in, and, despite all their seclusion, maidens are brought to ruin. It was for their protection, as time passed and wickedness spread, that the order of knights errant was instituted. To defend maidens, protect wi widows, and come to the aid of orphans and those in need. This is the order to which I belong. My brother goat herds, and I thank you for the kindness and hospitality you have shown to me and my squire, for although my natural law all men are obliged to favor knight-errant, still, because I know that without knowing this obligation you welcomed me and treated me so generously, I wish, with all my good will, to thank you for yours. 
and there is a note, and it says Don Quixote's soliloquy incorporates all the elements traditionally associated with the classical aid, the classical idea of the golden age. The long harangue, which could very easily have been omitted, was declaimed by our knight because the acorns served to him brought to mind the golden age, and with it the desire to make that foolish speech to the goat herds who, stupefied and perplexed, listened without saying a word. Sancho, too, was silent, and ate acorns, and made frequent trips to the second wineskin, which had been hung from a cork tree, to cool the wine. Don Quixote spent much more time speaking than it took to finish supper, but when it was concluded, one of the goat herds said, So that your grace, Signor Knight, can say even more truly that we welcomed you with a ready good will, we want to give you joy and pleasure by having a friend of ours sing for you. He'll be here very soon. He's a smart lad, and very much in love, and above all, he knows how to read and write and is good and is so good a musician on the rebeck that you couldn't say, you couldn't ask for anything better. And a rebeck is a precursor of the violin, mentioned frequently in pastoral novels. No sooner had the goat herd said this than the sound of the rebeck reached their ears, and, for, and a short while later the one playing it appeared a good-looking boy no more than twenty-two years of age. His friends asked if it had been eaten. If he had... His friends asked if he had eaten, and when he answered that he had, the one who had made the offer said, That means, Antonio, that you could do us the favor of singing a little, and this gentleman, our guest, can see that in the woods and forests we also have somebody who knows about music. We told him about your tablets, and we want you to show them and prove we told the truth, and so I ask you please to sit down and sing the ballad about your love that your uncle and the vicar composed for you, the one the people in the village liked so much. I'd be happy to, the boy replied, and without having to be asked a second time, he sat on the trunk of a fallen oak, and, after tuning his rebeck with great charm, he soon began to sing these words. <coughs> I'm not going to sing. <laughs> it's called Antonio. I know, Olayala, that you adore me, though you haven't told me so, not even with your eyes, in the silent language of love. Since I know that you are clever, that you love me, I do claim, for love was ne'er unrequited if it had been proclaimed. It is true that once or twice, Olala, you have it known that your soul is made of bronze and your white bosom of stone. But hiding behind your reproaches and your virtuous rebukes, hope may reveal a glimpse of the hemmed edge of her cloak. My faith is firm and steadfast, its eager response ne'er wanes, because not called ne'er waxes, because it has been chosen. If love is courteous, if love is courtesy, then yours lets me conclude that the outcome of my hopes will be just as I assume. And if service plays a part in making a bosom kind, then those that I have rendered will help to sway your mind. For if you think about it, more than once I have worn the same clothes on a Monday, that honored Sunday morn, for love and finery always walk hand in hand, and in your eyes I wish always to seem gallant. Speak not of my dances for you, the songs that I bestow so late into the night and before the rooster's crow. Speak not of my praises of you that I tell to all the world, though they have earned for me the displeasure of many a girl. I was singing your praises, and Teresa del Berrocal said, He thinks he adores an angel, and he loves a monkey instead. Thanks to all her trinkets, her dyes, and wigs, and falls, the god of love is deceived by beauty that is false. I said she lied, she grew angry, her cousin came to her aid, 
and challenged me, you know, what he said, and I did, and said, I love no one but you, yet I don't court you sinfully, though I beseech and woo you, there's more virtue in my glee. Mother Church has chains whose links are made of silk, I will join you there if you bend your neck to the yoke. If not, I make this vow by the blessed saintly choir, not to leave these mountains, except as a capuchin friar. I know the Moog Sings Redemption is gone. <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> yeah, it's been gone for a while. <laughs> I sang once, that was good. <laughs> Here the goat herd ended his song, and although Don Quixote asked him to sing something else, Sancho Panza did not concur because he was readier for sleep than for hearing songs. And so he said to his master, Your grace ought to decide now where, he, where, where you're going to spend the night. The work these good men do all day doesn't allow them to spend their nights singing. Hmm. I understand you very well, Sancho, Don Quixote responded. It is clear to me that your visits to the wineskin ask to be repaid with sleep rather than music. It tasted good to all of us, thanks be to God, replied Sancho. I do not deny that, Don Quixote responded, but you can settle down wherever you like, where those of my profession prefer standing sigil to sleeping. Even so, Sancho, it would be good if you tended this ear again, for it is hurting more than is necessary. Sancho did as he was ordered, and when one of the goat herds saw the wound, he told him not to worry for he would give him a remedy that would heal it right away. And after picking some rosemary leaves, which grew there in abundance, he chewed them and mixed them with a little salt and applied them to Don Quixote's ear and bandaged it carefully, assuring him that no other medicine was needed, which was the truth. That song is going to the top of Spotify. I am listening to it on repeat. <laughs> that was the end of chapter 11. I am liking this. Need a little sippy sip. After all that singing, you know. Alright. Chapter 12. A hundred and more times. So thirsty. Regarding what a goat herd recounted to those who were with Don Quixote. At this moment, another young man approached, one of those who brought the goat herd's provisions from the village, and he said, Friends, do you know what has happened in town? How could we know? one replied. Well then, I'll tell you, the young man continued. This morning, the famous student shepherd named Grisostomo died, and they say he died for love of, for that accursed girl, Marcella, the daughter of Guillermo, the rich man, the same girl who dresses up like a shepherdess and wanders around the wild, empty, place, empty places. Marcella, did you say? asked one of them. The same, replied the goat herd. And the strange thing is that in his will he said he wanted to be buried in the countryside, like a moor, and that his grave should be at the bottom of the rocky hill where the spring at the cork tree is, because everybody knows, and they say he said so himself, that this is where he saw her for the first time. And he also asked for some other things that the abbots in the village say shouldn't be done, that it isn't right to do them because they seem heathenish. And to all of this, that great friend of his, Ambrosio, the student who dresses up like a shepherd too, says that everything Grisostomo wanted has to be done just the way he asked, with nothing left out, and the whole village is in an uproar about this, 
but people are saying that in the end they'll do what Ambrosio and his shepherd friends want. Tomorrow they'll come to bury him with great ceremony in the place, I said, and I think it will be something worth seeing. At least I'll be sure to go and see it, even though I'm supposed to go back to town tomorrow. We'll do it all the same, the goat herds responded, and we'll draw straws to see who has to stay behind and watch all the goats. Good idea, said one, but you won't be able to draw straws. I'll stay here for all of you. And don't think it's because I'm good or not very curious. It's just that the sharp branch I stepped on the other day makes it hard for me to walk. Even so, we thank you. And Don Quixote asked Pedro to tell him about the dead man and the shepherdess, to which Pedro responded that all he knew was that the dead man was a rich gentleman, a resident of a nearby village, who had been a student in Salamanca for many years, and then had returned home with a reputation for being very learned and well-read. He's got an ouchie and doesn't want to go. <laughs> Mainly, people said he knew that the science of the stars and what happens up there in the sky with the sun and the moon, because he would always tell us when there'd be clips of the sun and the moon. He would call... It was called an eclipse, my friend. Not a cli eclipse. When those two great heavenly bodies darken, said Don Quixote. But Pe Pedro, paying little attention to such trifles, continued with his story, saying, And he also could tell when the land would produce and when it would be barren. You mean barren, my friend, said Don Quixote. Barren, barren, replied, responded Pedro. It's all the same in the end. And what I'm saying is that because of what he told told them, his father and his friends who believed him became very rich because they listened when he said, this year plant barley, not wheat, and this year you can plant chickpeas and not barley. Next year there'll be good olive oil harvest, but in the next three you won't get a drop. The science is called astrology, said Don Quixote. I don't know what it's called, Pedro said, but I do know he knew all that, and even more. Finally, not many months after he came home from Salamanca, he suddenly appeared one day dressed like a shepherd, with a staff and sheepskin jacket instead of the long gown he wore as a scholar, and a close friend of his named Ambrosio, who had studied with him in Salamanca, dressed up like a shepherd too. I forgot what I forgot to say that Grisostomo, the dead man, was a great one for writing verses. In fact, he wrote the carols of the night of our Lord's birth and the place for Corpus Christi, and the lads from our village put on, and everybody said that they were wonderful. When the people in the village saw the two scholars suddenly dressed like shepherds, they were really surprised and couldn't guess the reason why they'd made so odd a change. At about this time, his father died, and Gros Gros Grisostomo inherited a big estate, goods as well as lands, so no small amount of livestock, both large and small, and a large amount of money, the boy became lord and master of all of this, and the truth is he deserved it all, for he was a very good companion, and a charitable man, and a friend of good people, and his face was like a blessing. Later on, people began to understand that the change in the way he dressed had been for no other reason than go wandering through these wild places, following after that shepherdess Marcella, our lad mentioned before, because our poor dead Grisostomo had fallen in love with her. And I want to tell you now who this girl is, because you ought to know. Maybe, and maybe there's no maybe about it. You won't hear anything like it in all the, your born days, even if you live to be as old as my mouth soars. Gross. <laughs> you mean... Methus Methusela? Methusela? Replied Don Quixote, unable to tolerate the goatherd's confusion of words. My mouth sores last a good long time, Pedro responded, and if, senor, you keep correcting every word I say, we won't finish in a year. Forgive me, my friend, said Don Quixote. I mentioned it only because there is such a great difference between mouth sores and Methuselah. But you answered very well, since my mouth sores live longer than Methuselah, so go, go on with your story, and I shall not contradict you again in anything. Well, senor, as I was saying, said the goat herd, in our village there was a farmer even richer than Gristosomo, Gristosomo's father, Gristosomo, I'm going to get his name right eventually, 
Chrysostomos' father, and his name was Guillermo. And God gave him not only great wealth, but also a daughter, whose mother died giving birth to her. And her mother was the most respected woman in his whole district. It seems to me I can see her now, with that face of hers shining like the sun on one side of the moon and on the other. More than anything else, she was a hard-working friend to the poor, and this... And for this reason, I believe that right this minute her spirit is enjoying God in the next world. Her husband, Guillermo, died of grief at the death of such a good woman, and their daughter, Marcella, was left a very rich girl in the care of an uncle who was a priest, the vicar of our village. The girl grew, and her bounty reminded us of her mother's, which was very great, though people thought the daughter's would be even greater. And it was, for when she reached the age of 14 or 15, no man could look at her and not bless God for making her so beautiful, and most fell madly in love with her. Yes, Star, thank you, thank you. <laughs> her uncle kept her carefully and modestly secluded, but even so, word of her great beauty spread so that, for her own sake, and because of her great fortune, not only the men of our village but those for many miles around, the best among them, asked, begged, and implored her uncle for her hand in marriage. But he, a good and honest Christian, though he waited, he wanted to arrange her marriage as soon as she was of age, didn't want to do it without her consent, and didn't even care about the profit and gain of the girl's estate that he would enjoy if he delayed their marriage. And by my faith, there was many a gossip in the village who said this in praise of the good priest. For I want you to know, Signor Knight, that in these small hamlets people talk and gossip about everything, and you can be sure, as I, as I am, that a priest must be better than good if his parishioners have to speak well of him, especially in a village. That is true, said Don Quixote, and please continue. The story is very good, and you, my good Pedro, tell it with a good deal of grace. May God's grace be with me. That's the one that matters. And for the rest, you should know that even though the uncle suggested names to his niece and told her the qualities of each of the many suitors begging for her hand and asked her to choose and marry a man she liked, she never said any of th anything except that she didn't want to marry just then. And since she was so young, she didn't feel able to bear the burdens of matrimony. Hearing these excuses, which seemed so reasonable, the uncle stopped asking and waited for her to get a little older when she would be able to choose a husband she liked because he said, and rightly so, that parents shouldn't force their children into marriage against their will. But then one day, to everybody's surprise, the finicky Marcella appeared dressed like a shepherdess and pay paying no attention to her uncle or to all the villagers who warned her not to do it. She started to go out to the countryside with the other shepherdesses and to watch over her own flock. And as soon as she appeared in public and her beauty was seen in the open, I can't tell you how many rich young men, noblemen, and farmers began to dress up like Grisostomo and to court her in these fields. One of them, as I've said, was our dead man, who, people said, had stopped loving her and began to worship her. And don't think that just because Marcella took on the liberty of a life that's so free, with so little seclusion, or none at all, she gave any sign or suggestion that would be damaged her modesty and virtue. Instead, she watches over her honor with so much vigilance that all that of all the men who woo and court her, not one has bo boasted or could truthfully claim that she'd given any hope of achieving his desire. For although she doesn't run from or avoid the company and conversation of the shepherds and treats them with courtesy and friendship, if any of them reveals his desire to her, even one in, as honest and holy as matrimony, she hurls it away from her like a stone in a catapult. And by living this way, she does more harm in this land than, than the plague, because her affability and beauty attract the hearts of those who try to woo her and love her, but her disdain and reproaches drive them to despair so that they don't know what to say about her, except to call her cruel and ungrateful, and other names that plainly show the nature of her disposition. And if you spend one day here, senor, you'd hear these mountains and valleys echoing with the lamentations of the disappointed men who follow her. Not very far from here is a place where there are m almost two dozen tall beech trees, and there's not one that doesn't have the name of Marcella carved and written on its smooth bark, and at the top of some there's a crown carved into the tree, as if the lover were saying even more clearly that Marcella wears and deserves the crown more than any other human beauty. Here a shepherd sighs. There another moans. Over yonder amorous songs are heard, and farther on desperate lamentations. 
One spends all the hours of the night sitting at the foot of an oak tree or a craggy or a rocky crag, not closing his weeping eyes, and the sun finds him in the morning, absorbed and lost in his thoughts. Another gives no respite or rest to his sighs. And in the middle of the burning heat of the fiercest summer afternoon, lying on the burning sand, he sends his complaints to the merciful heaven. And over this one, that one, and all of them, the beautiful Marcella, free and self-assured triumphs, and those of us who know her are waiting to see her haughtiness will end, and who will be the fortunate man to conquer so difficult a nature and enjoy such extreme beauty. Since everything I've told you is the absolute truth, I take it for granted that what our lad said about that people, about what people were saying about the reason for Cristosomo's death is also true. And so in my advice, senor, is that tomorrow you be sure to attend his burial, which will be something worth seeing, because Cristosomo has a lot of friends, and it's more, it's no more than half a league from here to the place where he wanted to be buried. I shall be certain, too, said Don Quixote, and I thank you for the pleasure of giving me with the narration of so delightful a story. Oh, replied the goatherd, I still don't know the half of what's happened to the lovers of Marcella, but it may be that tomorrow we'll meet some shepherd on the way who will tell us about them. For now, it would be a good idea if you slept under a roof, because the night air might hurt your wound, though the medicine you've put on it is so good there's no reason to fear any trouble. Sancho Panza, who by this time was cursing the goat herd's endless talk, also asked his master to go into Pedro's hut to sleep. He did so, and spent the rest of the night thinking of his lady Dulcinea, in imitation of Marcella's lovers. Sancho Panza settled down between Rocinante and his donkey and slept, not like a scorned lover, but like a man who had been kicked and bruised. End of chapter 12. Like this. I am going to be so buff after holding this book. <laughs> Let's see. Things are getting more complicated. They are, yeah. They are. Chapter 13 has to be at least 10 pounds. I should weigh it. I'm going to weigh it. I'll weigh it tonight. Popeye Moog. <laughs> just, just super bulky arms. <laughs> I will weigh it tonight. It is, it's, it's a thick, it's a thick one. That's satisfying. Forearms of steel. Yeah, I'm doing the gossipy, the gossipy, uh, talk. It's making, making my throat dry. It's a thick one. That's satisfying. Thick book. It's a book. <laughs> These are great. We probably should include, like, a, a quote generator. Or not a quote generator, but, like, where you can add quotes. And then have a command where random ones just pop up. I think that would be funny. We're going to do that. <laughs> ideas. So many ideas. We'll do it. We'll do it. All right. Chapter 13. In which the tale of the shepherdess Marcella is concluded and the and other events are related. An out of context journal? That sounds amazing. I love it. But no sooner had day begun to appear on the balconies of the east than five of the six goat herds got up and went to wake Don Quixote and tell him that if he was still of a mind to go see the famous burial of Cristosomo. Oh my gosh, I feel like they changed the spelling of the name. Unless I am just mixing up the letter. No, I'm totally just mixing up the letter. Grisostomo. It's me. I'm the monster. It's me. Okay. 
Risostomo, they would accompany him. Don Quixote, who desired nothing else, got up and ordered Sancho to saddle and prepare the mounts immediately, which he did very promptly, and just as promptly they all set out. And they had gone less than a quarter of a league when, at an intersection with another path, they saw coming toward them approximately six shepherds, dressed in black sheepskin jackets, their heads crowned with wreaths of cypress and bitter, bitter oleander. Each carried a heavy staff of holly in his hand. With them rode two gentlemen on horseback, very well equipped for traveling, and accompanied by three servants on foot. As the two groups drew close, they exchanged courteous greetings, asked where the other was going, discovered they were all heading for the burial site, and so began to travel together. Oh, thank you, Wadsworth. That's cool context. Chrysostomo, meaning golden mouth in Greek. That's fun. One of the men on horseback, speaking to his companion, said, It seems to me, Signor Vivaldo, that we must consider our lingering to see this extraordinary funeral as time well spent, for it most certainly will be extraordinary. According to the strange tales these shepherds have told us, not only about the dead shepherd, but about the murderous shepherdess. I think so too, responded Vivaldo, and I would have been willing to linger not merely one day, but four in order to see it. Don Quixote asked what they had heard about Marcella and Grisostomo. The traveler repli replied that early that morning they had encountered the shepherds and, seeing them in such mournful dress, had asked the reason for their going about in that manner, and one of them had recounted the strange behavior and beauty of a shepherdess named Marcella, and the love so many suitors had for her, and the death of Chrysostomo, who, to whose burial they were going. In short, he related everything that Pedro had told Don Quixote. This conversation ended, and another began when the traveler called Vivaldo asked Don Quixote the reason for his going about armed in that manner when the land was so peaceful, to which Don Quixote replied, The exercise of my profession does not allow or permit me to go about in any other manner. Tranquility, luxury, and repose were invented for pampered courtiers, courti courtiers but travail tribulation, and arms were invented and created only for those whom the world calls knights-errant, and I, although unworthy, am the least of that number. As soon as they heard this, they considered him mad, and to learn more and see what sort of madness this was, Vivaldo asked him the meaning of knights-errant. "'Have your graces not read?' responded Don Quixote." the annals and histories of England, in which are recounted the famous deeds of King Arthur, whom in our Castilian ballads we continuously call Nar King Artus. According to an ancient and widespread tradition throughout the kingdom of Great Britain, this king did not die, but, through the art of enchantment, was turned into a crow, and in time will return to rule and recover his kingdom and scepter, for this reason, it can be demonstrated that no Englishman has ever killed a crow from that time to this. Well, it was in the days of this good knight, of this good king, that the famous chivalric order of the Knights of the Round Table was instituted, and, in these same chronicles, in the minutest detail, there is also a recounting of the love between Sir Lancelot of the Lake and Queen Gene Genevieve. Guinevere. Why did I say Gene Genevieve? I'm like pretending that it's French. Queen Guinevere. Their an intermediary and confident being the highly honored Duena Quintanona. Quintanona. And here was born that well known ballad so praised in our Spain. Never was a knight so well served by ladies as was lancelot when he came he from brittany came followed by the sweet and gentle tale of his feats of love and of valour since that time from one generation to the next the order of chivalry has extended and spread through many different parts of the world 
and among its members, famous and known for their great deeds, were the valiant Amadis of Gaul, and all his sons and grandsons unto the fifth generation, and the valorous Felix Marte of Hircania, and the never-sufficiently praised tyrant Loblanc, and in our own time we have almost seen and communicated with and heard the invincible and valiant knight Belianis of Greece. This, then, gentlemen, is what it means to be a knight-errant, and the order of chivalry is just as I have said, and in it, as I have also said, I, though a sinner, have taken my vows, professing exactly what was professed by the knights I have mentioned. And therefore I wander these solitary and desolate places in search of adventures, determined to bring my arm and my person to the most dangerous that fortune may offer in defense of the weak and helpless. These words fully persuaded the travelers that Don Quixote had lost his reason, and they realized the nature of the madness that controlled him, and felt the same astonishment that was felt by all who came to know it. Vivaldo, who was a very clever person with a merry disposition, wanted to give Don Quixote the opportunity to go on with his nonsense and entertain them for the short distance that remained before they reached the burial site. And so he said, It seems to me, Signor Knight Errant, that your grace has taken a vow to follow one of the most austere professions in the world, in my opinion, not even Carthuli Carthusian, Carthusian friars, 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 <laughs> have one so austere. There's made me austere, responded our Don Quixote, but I have some doubt that it is just as necessary in the world, because, if truth be told, the soldier, when he carries out his captain's orders, does no less than the captain who issues the orders. I mean to say that the religious in absolute peace and tranquillity ask heaven for the well-being of the world, but we soldiers and knights affect what we ask, defending the world with the valor of our good right arms and the sharp edge of our swords, not protected by a roof, but under the open sky, subject to the unbearable rays of the sun in summer and the icy blasts of winter. In this way we are ministers of God on earth, the arms by which his justice is put into effect on earth. And since the deeds of war and all things concerned with and related to war cannot be effected except with toil, perspiration, and travail, it follows that those whose profession it is undoubtedly face greater difficulties than those who in tranquil peace and repose pray to God to favor those who cannot help themselves. I do not mean to say, nor has it even passed through my mind that the state of knight-errant is as virtuous as that of a cloistered relig religious. I wish only to suggest, given what I must suffer, that it is undoubtedly more toilsome and more difficult, more subject to hunger and thirst, more destitute, straitened, and impoverished, for there can be no doubt that knights errant in the past endured many misfortunes in the course of their lives, and if some rose to be emperors through the valor of their mighty right arms, by my faith it cost them dearly in the quantities of blood and sweat they shed, and if those who rose to such great heights had not had enchanters and wise men to help them, they would have been thwarted in their desires and deceived in their hopes." I am of the same opinion, replied the traveller. But there is one thing, among many others, concerning knights errant, that seems objectionable to me, and it is that when they find themselves about to embark on a great and perilous adventure, in which there is a manifest danger that they will lose their lives, never at the moment of undertaking it do they think of commending themselves to God, as every Christian is obliged to do at times of danger. Instead, they command themselves to their ladies with as much zeal and devotion as if those ladies were their god, and to me this seems to have a somewhat heathenish smell. Signor, responded Don Quixote, under no circumstances can they do any less, and the knight-errant did not 
who did otherwise would fall into dis disrepute for it is tradition and custom in knight errantry that the knight errant who is about to embark on some great feat of arms and has his lady before him must gently and lovingly turn his eyes towards her as if asking her to favour and protect him in the fearful battle he is undertaking even if no one is there to hear him he is obliged to murmur a few words under his breath in which with all his heart he commends himself to her we have countless examples of this in his histories but one should not assume therefore that they fail to commend themselves to god for they have the time and place to do that in the course of combat even so replied the traveller i still have a misgiving and it is that i have often read that words are exchanged between two knights errant and one word leads to another their anger rises they turn their horses and ride off a good distance to the far ends of the field and then without further ado they ride at full tilt towards each other and in the middle of the charge they commend themselves to their ladies and what usually happens after their encounter is that one falls from his horse run through by his opponent's lance and the same thing happens to the other as well for less for unless he holds on to his horse's mane he cannot help but fall to the ground too but i don't know how the one who is dead had time to commend himself to god in the course of so swift a combat it would be better at the words he used during the charge to commend himself to his lady had been used instead to do what he ought to have done and was obliged to do as a christian furthermore I don't believe that all the knights errant have ladies to whom they can commend themselves, because not all of them are in love. That cannot be, responded Don Quixote. I mean, there cannot be a knight errant without a lady, because it, because it is as fitting and natural for them to be in love as for the sky to have stars, and, just as certainly, you have never seen a history in which you find a knight errant without a love. For if he had none, he would not be deemed a legitimate knight, but a bastard who entered the fortress of chivalry, not through the door, but over the walls, like a robber and a thief. Even so, said the traveller, it seems to me that if I remember correctly, I have read that Don Galliar, brother of the valorous Amadis of Gaul, never had a specific lady to whom he would commend himself, and despite this, he did he was not held in any less esteem, and was a very valiant and famous knight. To which our Don Quixote responded, Senor, one swallow does not a summer make. Furthermore, I happen to know that this knight was secretly very much in love, even though his courting all the lovely ladies he found attractive was a natural inclination that he could not resist. However, it is clearly demonstrated that there was one lady whom he had made mistress of his will, and to her he commended himself very frequently and very secretly because he prided himself on being a secretive knight. Well then, if it is essential that every knight errant has to be in love, said the traveller, we most certainly can suppose that your grace is as well, since you are a member of the profession. And unless your grace prides himself on being as secretive as Don Galayor, I must, I most earnestly implore you, in the name of all this company and on my own behalf, to tell us the name, the kingdom, the condition, and the beauty of your lady, for she would think herself fortunate if all the world knew she was loved and served by the sort of knight your grace appears to be whereupon Don Quixote heaved a great sigh and said, I cannot declare whether my sweet enemy would be pleased or not if the world were to know that I serve her. I can only state, responding to what you so courteously ask, that her name is Dulcinea, her kingdom Toboso, which is in La Mancha. Her condition must be that of princess, at the very least, for she is my queen and lady and her beauty is supernatural, for in it one finds the reality of all the impossible and chimerical aspects of beauty which poets attribute to their ladies. 
Her tresses are gold, her forehead Elysian fields, her eyebrows the arches of heaven, her eyes suns, her cheeks roses, her lips coral, her teeth pearls, her necklace alabaster, her neck alabaster, her bosom marble, her hands ivory, her skin white as snow, and the parts that modesty hides from human eyes are such, or so I believe and understand, that the most discerning consideration can only praise them, but not compare them. We would like to know her lineage, ancestry, and family, replied Vivaldo, to which Don Quixote responded, She is not of the ancient Roman families of Curtius, Scaeus, and Scipio, nor of the more modern colonists and Ursinos, nor of the Moncadas and Requesinus of Catalonia, nor even the Rebellus and Villanoves of Valencia, the Palafoxes, Nusas, Rocobertis, Cora, Coreas, Lunas, Alagonas, Ureas, Fosas, and Greras of Aragon. Aragon! <laughs> the Cerdas, Manriques, Menzo. Mendoza's, the Guzmanes of Castilla, the Alencastas, Palas, and Meneses of Portugal, but she is from, she is of the family of Toboso of La Mancha, a lineage so fine, although modern, that it can give a generous beginning to the most illustrious families of centuries to come, and I shall brook no reply to this except under the conditions inscribed by Servino beneath Orlando's victorious arms, which said, Let no one move, then, who cannot prove his worth against Roland. Although my lineage is the Cachopines of Laredo, responded the traveller, I won't dare compare it to that of Toboso of La Mancha, for, to tell the truth, that name has not reached my ears until now. Is it possible that n so notable a thing has not reached them? replied Don Quixote. All the others had been listening with great attention to their conversation, and even the goat herds and shepherds realized that Don Quixote was not in his right mind. Only Sancho Panza, knowing who he was and having known him since he was born, thought that everything his master said was true, but he did not have but he did have some doubts concerning the beauteous Dulce. Dulcinea of Toboso, because he had never heard of that name or that princess, even though he lived so close to Toboso. As they were conversing, they saw that coming down the pass formed by two high mountains were about twenty shepherds, all wearing black wool jackets, and crowned with wreaths that, as they saw later, were made either of yew or cypress. Six were carrying a bier covered with a great variety of flowers and branches. When one of the goat herds saw this, he said, Those men there are carrying the body of Chrysostomo, and the foot of that mountain is the place where he said he should be buried. For this reason they hurried to reach the spot, which they did as the bearers were setting the bier on the ground, and, with sharp picks, Four of them began digging the grave to one side of a rugged crag. They exchanged courteous greetings, and then Don Quixote and those who had accompanied him began to look at the bier, and on it, covered with flowers, they saw a dead body, apparently thirty years of age, dressed as a shepherd, and although he was dead, he showed signs of having had a handsome face and a gallant disposition when he was alive. Around him on the bier were bound volumes, and many papers, both opened and closed. And those who were watching, and the men who were digging the grave, and everyone else who was present maintained a wondrous silence, until one of those who had been carrying the dead man said to another, Look carefully, Ambrosio, to see if this is the place Chrysostomo mentioned, since you want everything he asked for in his will to be carried out to the letter. It is, Ambrosio responded, for here my unhappy friend often told me of the history of his misfortune. Here, he said, he first saw that mortal enemy of the human race, and here was also where he first declared to her his desire. 
as honest as it was amorous, and here was where Marcella finally disillusioned and disdained him for the last time, putting an end to the tragedy of his wretched life. Here, in memory of so much affliction, he wanted to be consigned to the depths of eternal oblivion. And turning to Don Quixote and the travelers, he went on to say, This body, signores, that you look at with pitying eyes, was the depository of a soul in which heaven placed an infinite number of its gifts. This is the body of Chrysostomo, who was unique in intelligence, unequaled in courtesy, inimitable in gallantry, peerless in friendship, faultless in generosity, serious without presumption, merry without vulgarity, and finally, first in everything it means to be good, and second to none in everything it means to be unfortunate. He loved deeply and was rejected. He adored and was scorned. He pleaded with a wild beast, in importuned a piece of marble, pursued the wind, shouted in the desert, served ingratitude, and his reward was to fall victim to death in the middle of his life, which was ended by a shepherdess, whom he attempted to immortalize, so that she would live on in memory, which could have been clearly shown in those papers you see there if he had not ordered them committed to the fire when his body had been committed to the earth. You would use greater harshness and cruelty with them, said Vivaldo, than their own master, for it is neither just nor correct to carry out the will of someone whose orders go against all reasonable thought. You would not think so highly of Caesar Augustus if he had agreed to carry out what divine Mantua had ordered to his will. And there was a note here that said Virgil requested that Aeneas be born at his death. And so, Signor Ambrosio, Although you surrender your friend's body to the ground, do not surrender his writings to oblivion. If he gave the order as an aggrieved man, it is not proper for you to carry it out like a foolish one. Rather, by giving life to these papers, you can have Marcella's cruelty live on as an example to those who live in future days so that they can flee and run from similar dangers. I and my companions know the history of your loving and desperate friend, and the reason of his death and what he ordered to have done when his life was over. From this lamentable history, one can learn how great was the cruelty of Marcella, the love of Grisostomo, and the steadfastness of your friendship, as well as the final destination of those who madly gallop along the path that heedless love places in front of them. Last night, we learned of Grisostomo's death, and that he would be buried in this place, and filled with curiosity and pity, we halted our journey and decided to come and see with our own eyes what had saddened us so much when he when we heard it. And as recompense for this sorrow, and the desire born in us to alleviate it, if we could, we beg you, at least I implore you, O oh, most discreet Ambrosio, not to burn these papers and to allow me to have some of them. And not waiting for the shepherd to respond, he stretched out his hand and took some of the papers closest to him. Seeing this, Ambrosio said, Out of courtesy I consent to your keeping, Signor, the ones you already have, but to think that I won't burn those that remain is to think vain thoughts. Vivaldo, who wanted to see what the paper said, immediately opened one of them and saw that it had the title Song of Despair. When Ambrosio heard the title, he said, this is the last paper the unfortunate man wrote, and so that you may see, Signor, the lengths to which his misfortunes had driven him, read it aloud so that read it aloud so that all may hear, for the time it will take to dig the grave will be more than enough time for you to read it. I will do that gladly, said Vivaldo, and since all those present had the same desire, they came to stand around him, and Vivaldo, reading in a clear voice, saw that it had said and then we start a new chapter and it's the writings <laughs> all right chapter 14 
in which are found the desperate verses of the deceased shepherd, along with other unexpected occurrences. Aww. <laughs> Mm. Here we go. Chrysostomo's song. Again, I'm not singing this. It's also long, so I'm not singing it. Sure you, most cruel, wish all tongues to proclaim, all men to know the harsh power of your will. I will have hell itself teach a mournful song to my grieving breast, then add to that discord with the stridency of this my tuneless voice, and, companion to my desire as it strives, to tell of my sorrow and your heartless deeds, that fearful voice will resound, worse torment, it will carry pieces of my wretched heart. Listen, then, to no harmonious song, bring to the clangor rising from the depths of my embittered breast and borne by frenzy, sounding to my delight and your displeasure. The roar of the lion, the fearful howling of the savage wolf, the terrible hisses of the scaly serpent, the ghastly shrieks of monsters, the portents of the raven's croak, the din of winds battling unsettled seas, the great bull's vengeful bellow in defeat, the widowed turtle dove's broken call, the grief-stricken hooting of the envied owl, and the cries of all the souls in darkest hell, let these join with my spirit in its grief, blending in song, confounding all the senses, for the merciless anguish I endure demands new modes, new styles for its recounting. The wailing echoes of this dissonance will not be heard on sands of Father Tahoe or the Andalusian olive groves. My heartless agony will be carried by a deadless man's t a dead man's tongue in words that will survive him to craggy heights or bottomless ravines, to darkened valleys, to some hostile shore bare of human commerce, or to places where the sunlight ne'er was seen, or to the hordes of ravening toxic beasts that live and thrive on the Libyan plain, for though in desert wastes the horse uncertain echoes of my ills may sound with unmatched harshness like your own as a privilege of my destiny cut short they will be carried all around the world disdain can kill suspicions true or false can bring down patience and jealousy slays with grim ferocity long absence can confound a life feared oblivion defeats the surest hope for a life of happiness. In all this, certain death cannot be fled. But I, O oh wondrous miracle, I live on, jealous, absent, disdained, and certain of suspicions that fell me, forgotten by one for whom I burn with ever hotter flame, and in so much torment I can never see even the shadow of hope that, in despair, I do not attempt to find. Rather, to carry my woe to the furthest extreme, I vow eternally to live bereft of hope. Can one feel hope and at the same time fear? Or is it wise to do so when the reasons for fear are so much stronger? Must I then close these eyes when flint-hard jealousy appears before them, only to watch it tear a thousand open wounds deep in my soul? Who would not open wide the door to despair when he sees disdain undistinguished, laid bare? When he sees all his suspicions, O oh, bitter transformation, converted into truths, an honest truth transmuted into lies? O oh, jealousy, in the kingdom of love a pitiless tyrant, place these my hands in chains, and condemn me, disdain, to be bound in twisted rope. But woe is me when in your memory, O oh, cruelest triumph, my suffering is smothered and erased. I die. I die. And so that I may never hope for a good end in my death or life, I will be steadfast in my vag... vagaries? 
say that true love is bound to succeed, say the soul most enslaved to the ancient tyranny of love lives most free, say that my enemy is beautiful in body and in soul, that I bear the blame for her forget for her forgetting me, that love inflicts these sorrows and these ills to keep his realm in order and at peace. With this thought and a merciless, cruel scourge, I will slash and cut the brief time left to me by your disdain and offer to the winds this soul and body uncrowned by the palm of a laurel of future bliss and joy to come. You, whose unreason shows the reason clear that forces me to end this weary life, grown hateful to me, can see the patent signs of the fatal wound that cuts this heart in two, and how I bend, submissive to your will, and if, by chance, you learn that I deserve to have clouds fill the fair sky of your eyes when you hear of my death, forbid it, for I want you unrepentant, without remorse, when I hand to you the ruins of my soul. And then your laughter at that grievous time will show my end with cause of your rejoicing. What lack of wit to caution you in this, when I know your brightest glory lies in seeing that my life draws so quickly to its close. Come, it is time for Tantalus to rise with all his thirst of the abysmal deeps. Let Sisyphus come, bearing the awful weight of that dread stone, let Tidius bring the vultures, let Ixion hasten to the remorseless wheel, and the grim sisters ceaseless at their toil. May they pass their mor mortal torments to my breast, and in hushed voices let them sadly chant. If one in despair deserves such obsequies, songs to a body not yet in its shroud, and the three-faced guardian of the gates of hell, Chimeras, monsters of by the thousands, let them entune the dol dolorous counterpoint, for there can be no better funeral rite than this, I think, for one who dies of love. Song of despair, do not weep at leaving me, since that will swell the joy of one who is the reason for your birth and my misfortune. Do not grieve for me, even in the grave. Those who had listened to Grisostomo's song thought it was very good, though the one who read it said he did not think it conformed to the accounts he had heard of Marcella's virtue and modesty, because in it Grisostomo complained of jealousy, suspicions, and absence, all to the detriment of Marcella's good name and reputation, to which Ambrosio, as the one who knew best the most hidden thoughts of his friend, replied, Signor, so that you may think free yourself of this doubt, you ought to know that when the unfortunate man wrote this song he was absent from Marcella. He had absented himself from her voluntarily to see if absence would have its customary effects on him, and since there is nothing that does not vex the absent lover, and no fear that does not overwhelm him, Chrysostomo was as vexed by the jealousy he imagined as the suspicions he feared as if they had been real. And with this, the truth of Marcella's reputation for virtue, remains unshaken, for aside from her being cruel and somewhat arrogant and very disdainful, envy itself cannot, or should not, find any fault in her. That is true, responded Vivaldo. He wanted to read another of the papers he had rescued from the fire, but was stopped by a marvelous vision. This is what it seemed to him that suddenly appeared before his eyes at the top of the crag where the grave was being dug, there came into view the shepherdess Marcella, whose beauty far surpassed her fame for beauty. Those who had not seen her before looked at her in amazement and silence, and those who were already accustomed to seeing her were no less thunderstruck than those who had not seen her until then. But no sooner had he seen her than Ambrosio, showing signs of outrage, said to her, do you come, O savage basilisk of the, these mountains, to see if with your presence blood spurts from the wounds of this wretched man whose life was taken by your cruelty? There's a footnote. It says, according to a medieval legend, the wounds of a murder victim would bleed in the presence of the killer. 
or do you come to gloat over the cruelties of your nature, or to watch from that height like another heartless Nero? The flames of burning Rome, or in your arrogance to tread on this unfortunate corpse as the ungrateful daughter of Tarquinus did to the body of her father. And there's a footnote. It says the reference is to Tilia, the wife, not the daughter, of the Roman king Tarquinus the Proud. Tell us quickly why you have come, or what it is you want most. For since I know that Grusostomo's thoughts never fail to obey you in life, I shall see to it that even though he is dead, those who called themselves his friends will obey you as well. I do not come, O oh Ambrosio, for any of the causes you have mentioned, Marcella responded. But I return here on my own behalf to explain how unreasonable are those who in their grief blame me for the death of Grisostomo, and so I beg all those present to hear me, for there will be no need to spend much time or waste many words to persuade discerning men of the truth. Heaven made me, as all of you say, so beautiful that you cannot resist my beauty and are compelled to love me, and because of the love you show me, you claim that I am obliged to love you in return. I know with the natural understanding that God has given me that everything beautiful is lovable but I cannot gas grasp why. Simply because it is loved, the thing loved for its beauty is obliged to love the one who loves it. Further, the lover of the beautiful thing might be ugly, and since ugliness is worthy of being avoided, it is absurd for anyone to say, I love you because you are beautiful, you must love me even though I am ugly. But in the event the two are equally beautiful, it does not mean that their desires are necessarily equal, for not all beauties fall in love. Some are a pleasure to the eye, but do not surrender their will, because if all beauties loved and surrendered, there would be a whirl of confused and misled wills, not knowing where they should stop. For since beautiful subjects are infinite, desires would have to be infinite, too. According to what I have heard, true love is not divided and must be voluntary, not forced. If this is true, as I believe it is, why do you want to force me to surrender my will, obliged to do so simply because you say you love me? But if this is not true, then tell me, if the heaven that made me beautiful and made me ugly instead, would it be fair for me to complain that none of you loved me? Moreover, you must consider that I did not choose the beauty I have, and, such as it is, heaven gave it to me freely without my requesting or choosing it. And just as the viper does not deserve to be blamed for its venom, although it kills, since it was given the venom by nature, I do not deserve to be reproved for being beautiful, for beauty in the chaste women is like a distant fire or sharp-edged sword. They do not burn or cut the person who does not approach them. Honor and virtue are adornments of the soul, without which the body is not truly beautiful, even if it seems to be so. And if chastity is one of the virtues that most adorn and beautify both body and soul, why should a woman, loved for being beautiful, lose that virtue in order to satisfy the desire of a man who, for the sake of his pleasure, attempts with all his might and main to have her lose it. I was born free, and in order to live free I chose the solitude of the countryside. The trees of these mountains are my companions, the clear waters of these streams my mirrors. I communicate my thoughts and my beauty to the trees and to the waters. I am a distant fire and a far-off sword. Those whose eyes forced them to fall in love with me I have discouraged with my words. If desires feed on hopes, and since I have given no hope to Grisostomo or to any other man regarding these desires, it is correct to say that his obstinacy is not my cruelty, is what killed him. And if you claim that his thoughts were virtuous, and for this reason I was obliged to respond to them, I say that when he revealed to me the virtue of his desire on the very spot where his grave is now being dug, I told him that mine was to live perpetually alone and have only the earth enjoy the fruit of my seclusion and the spoils of my beauty and if he 
despite that discouragement, wished to persist against all hope and sail into the wind, why be surprised if he drowned in the middle of the gulf of his folly? If I had kept him by me, I would have been false. If I had gratified him, I would have gone against my own best intentions and purposes. He persisted, though I discouraged him. He despaired, though I did not despise him. Tell me now if it is reasonable to blame me for this grief. Let the one I deceived complain. Let the man despair to whom I did not grant a hope I had promised, or speak if I called to him, or boast if I accepted him. But no man can call me cruel or a murderer if I do not promise, deceive, call to, or accept him. Until now heaven has not ordained that I love, and to think that I shall love of my own accord is to think the impossible. Let this general discouragement serve for each of those who solicit me for his own advantage. Let it be understood from this day forth that if anyone dies because of me, he does not die of jealousy or misfortune, because she who loves no one cannot make anyone jealous, and discouragement should not be taken for disdain. Let him who calls me savage basilisk avoid me as he would something harmful and evil. Let him who calls me ungrateful not serve me, unapproachable not approach me, cruel not follow me. Let him not seek out, serve, approach, or follow in any way this savage, ungrateful, cruel, unapproachable basilisk. For if his impatience and rash desire killed Grisostomo, why should my virtuous behavior and reserve be blamed? If I preserve my purity in the company of trees, why should a man want me to lose it if he wants me to keep it in the company of men? As you know, I have wealth of my own and do not desire anyone else's. I am free and do not care to submit to another. I do not love or despise anyone. I do not deceive this one or solicit that one. I do not mock one or amuse myself with another. The honest conversation of the shepherdesses from these hamlets and tending to my goats are my entertainment. The limits of my desires are these mountains, and if they go beyond here it is to contemplate the beauty of heaven and the steps whereby the soul travels to its first home. So I'm super glad that she spoke up because it is not cool to blame <laughs> the death on her, clearly. And having said this, and not waiting to hear any response, she turned her back and entered the densest part of a nearby forest, leaving all those present filled with admiration as much, as, as much for her intelligence as for her beauty. And some, those who were pierced by the powerful arrow of the light in her beautiful eyes, gave indications of wishing to follow her, disregarding the patent discouragement they had heard. Seeing this, Don Quixote thought it an appropriate time to put his chivalry into practice by coming to the aid of a maiden in distress, and he placed, on, he placed his hand on the hilt of his sword, and in a loud, clear voice he said, Let no person, whatever his circumstance or condition, dare to follow the beautiful Marcello, lest he fall victim to my fury and outrage. She has shown with clear and sufficient reason that she bears little or no blame in the death of Grisostomo, and she has also shown how far she is from acquiescing to the desires of any who love her, and therefore it is just that rather than being followed and persecuted, she should be honored and esteemed by all good people in the world, for she has shown herself to be only woman in it who loves with so virtuous a desire." Whether it was because of Don Quixote's warnings, or because Ambrosio said they should conclude what they owed to their good friend, none of the shepherds left or moved away from the place until, when the grave was dug and Bristosimo's papers had been burned, they placed his body in the ground, not without those present shedding many tears. They closed the grave with a heavy boulder until such time as the stone was finished that, Ambrosio said he planned to have made, with an epitaph that would be read, Here lies the sad cold body of a lover, 
a shepherd destroyed by an icy heart. The pitiless hand of cruel beauty killed him, extending the power of love's tyranny. Then they scattered many flowers and branches over the grave, offered their condolences to his friend Ambrosio, and took their leave of him. Vivaldo and his companion said goodbye, and Don Quixote bade farewell to his hosts and to the two travelers who asked him to accompany him to Sevilla, because it was a place so well suited to finding adventures, since more were to be found there on every street and around every corner than in any other city. Don Quixote thanked them for the information and their clear desire to favor him, but he said that for the moment he should not, nor did he wish to go to Sevilla, until he had emptied those mountains that were full, it was said, of villainous thieves. Seeing his firm determination, the travelers did not wish to importune him, and saying goodbye again, they left him and continued their journey, during which they had much to talk about, from the history of Marcella and Gri Oh man, they are totally spelling this name differently every time. Now it's spelled... G-R-I-O-S-T-O-M-O -O -O. Griostomo To the madness of Don Quixote Our knight resolved to seek out the shepherdess Marcella and offer to serve her in any way he could, but matters did not turn out as he expected, as is recounted in the course of this true history, the second part of which concludes here. That's the end of the chapter, and that's a great place to stop. That was an interesting chapter. It was very different from the other ones, and I actually really liked it. I really liked Marcella. I really liked that um, Cervantes actually gave her a voice to come out and say, like, this is not my fault. You cannot blame me for doing this. I have said no, I have turned everybody down, I live in the mountains to be by myself. Leave me alone. <laughs> so yes, we are on page 102. This is how far we are. <laughs> We're trucking right along. Uh, but yes, we are about to start part three of part one which is part three of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. But yes, I am still really enjoying it. It's, it's a good time. It's a hoot and a half, I will say. That is going to end our stream today. Oh, 1.7 hoots. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's going to end our stream today. Thank you all so, so much for being here. As always, whether you lurk, whether you chat, I 1000% appreciate you being here and I appreciate the support. I will be back very soon, continuing on right where we left off. If I do not see you then, I hope to see you even sooner. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. I will see you. Bye.